So I am Larry Sharp, and I ran for governor of New York as a libertarian in 2018, and I ran for the vice presidential slot in 2016 to try to be Gary Johnson's vice president, and I lost that bid in an internal election to Governor Bill Weld of Massachusetts. That's my libertarian uh, running. All right. Uh, so... Uh, without any further ado, so our, our topic that we wanted to discuss today was uh, obviously very broad. Um, see where you guys would take this. Uh, how to make Americans, I, I guess it's really how to maximize happiness. Um, so uh, you're the one who brought this topic. Uh, would you like to uh, start, Larry? Sure, absolutely. Um, one of the reasons one of the reasons why one of the reasons why i am a a libertarian is because i believe that the best way to move someone towards happiness is to allow us to be free to pursue happiness i think that's important and i think to myself is there a way that government could provide or give something that would make everybody happy now and everybody happy say 10 years from now and i think no I think there's no way government could do that. I think there's no way that government could, I think there's, I think there's no way that government could give everybody um, something that would make them happy, except allow them to pursue happiness to the best of their ability. I, I simply can't imagine any other way of making that happen. So I think government has to try to make people free to pursue happiness to the best of their ability and only try to move in when there is someone who's trying to stop someone from doing something or in some way, shape or form attacking somebody's rights. I feel as a general rule, when the government steps in, it's a monopoly. Monopolies are bad. So I want to do my best to create more monopoly, less monopolies, more options for monopolies, for non-monopolies, I should say. I'm not about destroying government. I'm about creating options for people to create more choices. That's really what I'm about. And I think that's really, that's what I'm really about more than anything. That's what I'm about. I'm about trying to get people to be happy. Okay. It's that so I, do I, am I, wait, am I responding or was that like... That's all. I, what I wanted to bring up is what I feel like, and I, I don't know you as well mm -hmm. as maybe I, 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 I could, but what I've heard from many people is that you are someone who believes about the outcomes more than anything. Yeah. Oh, okay. And, that, yeah. and that you are someone who does not like libertarians. Those are the two things <laughs> that I heard about you, that you don't like libertarians and that you were about outcomes. And in my view... I think the best outcomes you can possibly have mm -hmm. is if they are though there are those that are more carrot, less stick. If they're more instead of trying to knock down Goliaths, you're more about picking up Davids, localized as much as we possibly can. I think that's the issue. Gotcha. Okay, sorry, I, I didn't know that. I didn't know it was my. Um, mm. Okay, um, my brain Please is. Please go ahead. Here. Yeah. Um, okay, so I I think um, generally in terms of like um, what we want people to have or how we want people to be in terms of being able to choose things that make them happy. Obviously, we both agree on that. Um, I think that the reason why I veer uh, very hardcore off the any type of libertarian path is I think that um, I think that like freedom and rights are cheap words. Um, it mm -hmm. might have been. Scalia, I think, that used the term paper rights. Um, the, the idea that you can have like a, a right to be free or do something doesn't really mean much. You don't have the means to pursue it. And the reason why I like government is because it gives us a hopefully an equitable way to distribute things in society that enable people to pursue things that uh, would enable them to be happy. So that might take the form of a government provided health care or government funded education or things such as that. They give people opportunities that they wouldn't otherwise have to pursue happiness. The worry about once you do that, um, what, once you start to create, say, government-funded health care or government-funded anything, mm -hmm. if, if it is, if it's a monopoly, I feel almost every time it begins to fail. I'm not against government-funded gov government anything in theory, as long as there is something else to make, to give someone another option. I'll give you an example. If you have a single-payer system right now, right, mm -hmm. say we decided to make that happen in America. 
Okay. What I what I wouldn't what I'd be afraid of more than anything else is that there'd be a two tier system. And I see that right now in New York City where I live. The more people bring in lower uh, or cheaper health care, uh, for example, either Medicaid, Medicare, the more the better doctors start not taking insurance. And as they stop taking insurance, it creates two tiers, right? So now the wealthy go to the doctors who don't take insurance and the poorer people go to the doctors who do take insurance. So the, you find what you find up happening is more and more of the more and more of the people who are the have nots have less choice, less options, often worse doctors. Mm -hmm. If you look at a doctor office right now and they do, they take insurance, for example, they take things like Medicaid, Medicare, there's going to be two doctors in the office, in the practice and five um, and five uh, administrators who are more worried about you know, photocopying your card than anything else, right? That's what they're gonna be most worried about, photocopying your card, your information. You're in the way in that case. I mean, you're in a place to where you sit down at three o'clock for your three o'clock appointment, you don't get seen till 4.30. At every single time when you leave the doctor, they see you for five minutes and they walk away. And then, then what happens? Well, it ends every time with either a procedure or a prescription or a test because that's how they get paid. They are incentivized to, to, to build a government for money or build the insurance company. The insurance company or the government becomes the actual, the actual customer. And the actual customer is secondary and in the way. But if you look at another doctor's office where they actually take just cash, you pay them with a credit card or you pay them with a check or whatever you do, a cash, whatever, now you are the customer. So you show up at you know three o'clock for your appointment. You're seen maybe at three o five. The doctor spends more time with you, asks you questions like how are you sleeping, how are you eating, what's your stress level. They don't have to give you a they don't have to give you a solution to something. They don't have to give you a prescription or a test or a procedure because they're already paid. You wind up getting higher quality healthcare in a system that's more like that. Now you can't do that tomorrow, right? There's no way I could just go. Well, let's get rid of this tomorrow. But you could create a system. To where people start seeing that you could create a carrot to where now doctors start seeing more value and an example i brought up when i was running for office was the idea in new york state and I, i'll speak a lot about new york because i know new york the best but it, i'm sure it's true in other states too in new york state our medicaid Medi medicaid medicare bill is huge 60 million dollars 60 billion dollars if not more it's massive and most of it gets pushed down to local uh counties and they have to raise their taxes like they don't tomorrow to pay for it in unfunded mandates and it crushes the local economies it's a big problem one of the reasons there are many but one of the reasons why so many new yorkers are leaving the state so my idea was actuaries already know about how much someone's gonna spend based upon what box they put them in for medicaid or medicare so instead of saying you know hey go ahead and do this instead here's a card here's a here's a card it's a debit card with the amount of money that you would normally spend spend it any way you want just go. Spend the money in, in a doctor's office any way you like. And what winds up happening at that point is now doctors who don't take insurance can say, wait, so if I market to Medicaid, Medicare, I can get some of that money. Yeah, they'll begin to market to it. Now you can go to the doctors that you choose. You might say, Larry, well, what happens if the money runs out? Well, you're still on Medicaid and Medicare. But what should happen is people start to think differently about their health care. They'll change how they do things. They'll think differently about it. You'll begin to shop to get better doctors. Doctors should, in theory, lower their prices so that others can go there. And it should get people to want to get off of that and to get to a better situation and maybe even get better health care. That's the goal. So something like that is a good move towards better health care for people. Now, most people, as you know, will not do anything with that. They'll just go, I'm going to stay with Medicare. Or I must say with Medicaid, I'm do nothing. But there will be early adopters. And as there are early adopters, people are gonna say, wow, this actually works. I want into. These are the types of policies I'm talking about that are about creating more options for people. Am I making sense or no? Yeah, so I understand a lot of what you're saying. I think that you accurately identify a lot of problems. I just I don't think a lot of the solutions that we're proposing here would actually do anything to help any of the problems that we're talking about. Um, so for the first part, when we talk about like single payer, I know that you brought yep. up monopolies a few times. So 
monopolies aren't an inherently bad thing. T technically, uh, there's nothing wrong with a monopoly. Uh, and in some cases, monopolies can have a lot of advantages on a system. Um, typically, larger economies of scale means uh, more streamlined production, uh, more consistent pricing. Like There's a whole bunch of stuff that technically a monopoly is advantaged by. So the main area that we have for a disadvantage when it comes to dealing with monopolies is monopolies can engage in like predatory behavior. And without adequate competition, we have no way to hold that monopoly accountable. And that's like the, the really big thing. Yeah. Um, this doesn't really apply as much, though, with a government mon monopoly because we can vote on our government officials. So I, I don't think that just saying that like single payer healthcare would be a monopoly, I don't think that's necessarily a knock on it because unlike a privately managed firm, we do have the ability to hold a, a government or a public monopoly accountable because we vote on people that make policies related to said monopoly. But um, that doesn't actually happen though. There are two well, reasons why that does not happen. Oh wait, sure, hold on, wait, is, wait, 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 real quick because you said oh, like three million things. So let me just, oh, let me just sorry, get through yeah, some of these real quick. Sorry. Yeah, okay. okay. Uh, and then we can go back and forth on a, on a single point of view if you want to, that's fine. So. Um, Another thing you mentioned about how um, you know th these types of monopolies or these types of like government programs could theoretically create two tiers. Um, I live in the United States of America. You live in the United States of America. Very clearly, there are already two tiers, if not three or yes. four or five tiers. We very much have a tiered system that is very much tied sure. into the amount of money that you have, um, which gives you access to you know better and better and better levels of healthcare. Um, our, our tiered system is so great in the United States. People from around the world come here to take advantage of our like tier one healthcare. So we Correct. definitely already have like multiple tiers of healthcare. Uh, the idea that doctors are incentivized to make money with insurance. So I, I mean, we can go back on four. I don't think honestly that people go through that much med school and everything just so that they can like pres make more prescriptions as a doctor. I mean, there's a lot that we can get into in terms of why do doctors prescribe things? Um, you know, what should doctors be doing? And there's a lot of interesting conversation to be had there. Um, however, it, like if we're going to say that like doctors are incentivized to just do things to make money, I don't know how them taking, you know, private cash versus them taking like uh, private insurance is going to be much different. Like they're, it, theoretically, if they're, if they're just greedy and they want to make a certain amount of money rather than an insurance company telling them to make money, it might, it might be like the doctor's office telling them to make money or something. Um, you brought up the idea that like, you know, you go to a doctor's office and there's, you know, two doctors and only, you know, five assistants that are doing paperwork. That sounds like an argument in favor of a more unified single payer system uh, because then you would probably have an easier administrative process with things like Medicare or Medicaid. Um, I'm pretty sure the administrative overhead for those programs is like around like two and a half percent. It's much lower than the average. Now, that might be for a variety of reasons, but compared to private health insurance, the overhead for that type of, um, for like Medicare, Medicaid is, is much lower. Um, and then in terms of like shopping around for doctors, if you're paying cash, uh, I, there's, I mean, like in theory, I think this works for some forms of like quasi elective procedures. So I, I kind of like this model for stuff related to eyes. You don't necessarily need LASIK or contacts all the time or whatever, but you know, if you want to pay more for it, you can go out and do it. I don't know if I would say that this should work with everything related to medicine, because you're going to have a lot of inequitable things where, you know, like somebody's demand for insulin is, um, and then their socioeconomic status are, are going to play with each other in ways that we probably want to avoid in society. Like, oh, okay, well, good luck shopping for a doctor that you can afford insulin from. Um, and then these people aren't going to be as incentivized to provide care for these people because they're going to be like very high cost patients. Maybe they need more time. Like, I think there's a lot of problems that can, can uh, occur using that model too. Um, there's a lot of different places in this area that we can explore. I guess you can go on, on what point, um, yeah, wh wh which one you want to tag no into. No um, I want to go, the first part is the idea that we actually have control over this. Mm -hmm. We don't. And there are two reasons why we don't. Reason number one is in most cases when this happens, the people who run this are actually some form of board or commission. The boards or commissions are almost always selected by people. They're, they're, we, have no, we have no way of you know, deciding that they shouldn't be there or not unless they do something that's illegal or unethical or they get arrested or something like that. The boards and the commissions, those are the people who usually run these things. And then often they're the ones who make the rules and regulations and then if the legislation doesn't say no, it tends to be the actual thing, right? That's what it is. It becomes it, it becomes law or rule based upon people who we don't vote on. Well, but and I mean, we like, have nothing. We, That's what usually happens right now. But let me go to the next step. If you say, well, then, Larry, we'll just vote out the people who select these people. We don't do that either, right? Most incumbents, because of the way our system works with things like gerrymandering and red and blue districts, they keep getting elected again and again and again. I'm sure you know that the stats are that as a general rule, we don't actually, um, the, the politicians aren't doing what we want as a general rule, right? Most of tend not to, right? So I'm, I'm not sure I buy the idea that we actually have any, any power, but we do have some power, n not much, but more, I think, 
if there is a private sector, because we can decide to not go someplace. We, we have a chance of voting with our dollars or our feet, which again, isn't great when you have people who are very powerful, but it gives us some power and some control. I think you see that with how things are moving now, even socially in our country. You see companies doing what is, you know, trying to move the way that the country wants us to move. I do think you see that. Am, am I wrong with that? Can you repeat that last part again? Your, your thing lagged in the middle and I didn't cut the beginning oh, of that, that last on. question you asked. I can't hear you. Is that me again? Oh boy. Now I hear you. Okay. I think, okay, I asked if you could repeat that last, um, the last question you had said, because I missed the middle of it because it lagged out for a sec, probably when the headphones oh. turned off. Sorry. <laughs> so what I was saying is I don't think that we have actually much control over this. I think that we have, as I said, boards and such, they are the people who usually make this work. And when we try to vote people out, we tend not to. When it comes to things like um, voting locally, gerrymandering, red and blue districts, the people don't leave, right? We tend to not vote them out because we are afraid. We are afraid to the other to come in. Right? If we're in a red district, we're afraid of the blue. If we're in a blue district, we're afraid of the red. So we never bring the other person in. And the same rules keep popping up consistently. I think we do have some control when it is you know, voting with our dollars or voting with our feet. There is some control over that. Obviously, if you have more money, you have more control, but you will actually have some control. You can create a system to where we'll have some control versus none. But the second piece is, I don't think, I, and I hope I wasn't implying that, I'm not saying doctors only do things for money at all. That's not what I'm saying. I think doctors do a lot for money and for prestige and for the idea of trying to help people and many other things, being professional, lots of things. But if you ask many doctors why they're leaving the field or why they're asking their children to not be doctors, it's not because you don't make enough money. That isn't the biggest issue. That is an issue, obviously, but it's also because of things like paperwork and such. To your point about would it be easier for paperwork if it was single payer? I think you're probably correct that it probably would be easier when it comes to admin. That's probably true. I just think the service level will be so much lower. I can't think of a time where monopoly service has been good. I mean, maybe it maybe it exists. I don't know enough of, about, about the world to know. I mean, that, like the postal service work. is probably a decent example, right? If that were true, why do we have FedEx and why do we have UPS and why would we have so much competition in the postal service? I mean, we can have like I, other options for like delivering stuff you want, but in terms of like sending a letter to literally any mailbox that is like federally registered as an address in the United States, I think it's I think it is like relatively successful. Um, it's losing money, so I think financially that's not true. Um, its biggest customers are like FedEx and Amazon, so I think that's not true. I think many people aren't using it. I, I would not say that. It's, it's first of all, it's no longer a monopoly, right? It's a semi-monopoly, but it's not really a, a monopoly anymore. So I'm not sure I would count the post office as a monopoly. And even if I did, it's it's asked others to assist it in some way, shape, or form. So I, I don't think monopoly is a good idea. Now, when it comes to the idea of inequity, I'm not saying that we should get rid of the, of the safety net. I'm not. I'm saying we have to provide other options. I don't want to knock down the Goliath I want to build up more Davids. I think that's the biggest issue. And I'd rather work on building up more Davids. I'll give you another idea. That, well, yeah, that so may... real quick, just on, so on the post office example. So the post office, as of recently, like might have some financial trouble. Now, there's some interesting like regulations tied into that that we can talk about um, in terms that's of true. being required to prepay pensions or whatever. But yep. the post office is absolutely a successful service um, in, in ways that private enterprise doesn't seem to do. So for instance, what I said before, the post office is the only like package deliverer that will guarantee to any federally registered address in the United States that a package mm -hmm. will be delivered. I think that's really yep. impressive. And I think that's something that could only be done through some sort of public pressure. Because if it was just private, there are gonna be a lot of people in rural areas that, oh, well, you live too far out. It's not profitable to run something out there. Eh, screw you, you're done. And you're not gonna get a package. And if you don't believe me, we can just look at how ISPs function in the United States to see the different tiers of system available to uh, residences and cities with a lot of infrastructure versus rural areas that sometimes only have one provider that has like very, very limited connection um, even available for the people out there. So I think the post office is a decent example example of like, oh, well, this is a, a case where, I mean, we don't have to call it a monopoly if you want because other people offer kind of parallel services um, or whatever, or because the post office has customers that also do private packages. But I think the post office is pretty successful in terms of their stated mission, which is to be able to deliver a letter to any address in, in what, three or less days or four or less days, maybe if it's really remote in the United States. Um, yeah, 
I, 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 I think, but my, that's my point. The post office isn't a monopoly. The post office has found the niche, right? The post office's niche really is what you just said, right? If you want to send a package to Barrow, Alaska, right? You're right. The odds of FedEx sending them a pack, getting there are slim to none. In fact, the FedEx, the FedEx will probably give the package to the post office and pay them to deliver it. That's probably what will happen if FedEx had to deliver it to Barrow, Alaska. But by default, it's now not a monopoly, right? Because FedEx is there and UPS is there and now Amazon Prime is there. So it's not. And my, my point would be, it wasn't a monopoly because if it was a monopoly, then there wouldn't be a FedEx or a UPS or an Amazon Prime. So I'm not sure the post office is a good example. A am I wrong on this? Um, I, I mean, like there, the, the, I mean, I guess it depends how we define monopoly, but the, the post office legally functions as a, as a type of monopoly. So for instance, your, like your federal mailbox is literally exclusive access for the post office. Nobody is allowed to reach into that and interfere. It's a federal crime if you do it. Um, you can't slide sure. it. Yeah. So, I, but I mean, like, I guess we don't have to call it a monopoly if you want, because there are other, again, there are other services Correct. that offer similar services. Um, I do take issue describing the post office as, ha as having found a niche. I would argue that like things like FedEx and UPS have found a niche, where maybe if you've got bigger packages that you need to deliver something, you can use them but i think that like the usps as like the central carrier mail system in the united states is pretty successful um and I'm, I'm glad that we have it i think we're all better off for it and if that wasn't like a publicly forced system that had some kind of monopoly at least delivering to addresses uh i i think that there are i mean do you agree that there are places in rural you know usa that would just never get packages if it was only left to private companies like what incentive would they have to to deliver to them I'm not saying get rid of the post office. That's my point. Mm -hmm. I've never said get rid of the post office. Sure. I've never said get rid of Medicaid and Medicare. Okay. I think you I think you want to have that. Mm -hmm. My point is I want to have more than one option. I'm not against the I'm not against the post office existing and doing its job. Mm -hmm. I would be against you saying, which we don't right now, I would be against you saying, you know what? Only the post office can deliver packages. Sure. FedEx may not exist. UPS may not exist. Amazon Prime may not exist. Okay. That's my issue. And if we go single payer, that's what we're doing. We're saying other insurance companies may not exist. And that's my problem. Because mm -hmm. you know what? For some people, the post office is absolutely the answer. And for others, it's completely not. Sure. And if I want to give people the best option, let them have options. Sure. Do you ever think there might be a problem where... When we talk about giving people options, when we start tying yep. those options into how much money you make, that we might be cutting people off from some things that maybe if provided by the government would be otherwise like accessible to them. Can you give me an example of one thing you might be concerned about? Um, we could say schools, like the difference between private and public schools. Yep. No, I, I, I love the idea. Um, what I talked about, again, when I, I'm talking about policies now. Mm -hmm. What I spoke about in New York State. Um, in New York, we spend about twenty-eight to twenty-nine thousand dollars per kid per year in New York State. It's mm -hmm. embarrassingly high. It's the highest in the country, and usually, depending upon the year and who ranks us, we rank somewhere between twenty-five and thirty-seventh out of fifty. Mm -hmm. So we tend to not rank well. Once in a while, we get up in the top ten, depending upon who ranks us, but it's very rare. Um, usually, we we sound we, we we rank horribly, and when we rank so bad, we spend so much money. People just go, let's give people more money. Let's not support homeschooling. And New York State's very bad with homeschooling. Um, so what I would like us to do is, again, provide more options. Same thing. How about instead of us tying our um, tying our schools to property tax, which is, what I'm, which is what New York State does, instead it comes directly out of, out of the state government, flat fee, whatever number of kids you have in your school district, multiply it by X, whatever the dollars are, write the check. What does that mean? That means by default, the money follows the kid. So the, the money follows the kid by default. If the kid goes to the school district, the district gets more money. The, the kid leaves the school district, district gets less money. More kids means more money, everyone gets the same amount of money. Now in reality, what happens in reality is the wealthier parents donate money and donate stuff and raise money and they wind, and the wealthier families wind up having better schooling in general. Anyway, there's almost no way of stopping that. It's probably gonna happen. But not just that. If you also then supported homeschooling with some type of credit for people who wanted to homeschool, if you wanted to support uh, private schools with something like that, but at the same time still allow those kids who are homeschooled and private schooled, since the people are still paying taxes, to still join and go to the public schools. And what I mean by that is you could be homeschooled, but still be on the on the local chess team. Be homeschooled, still be on the football team. Be homeschooled, but still go to the, the class trip to Spain or whatever is the thing that you're doing. 
You do that, and now you're providing more options for people. Would someone who's wealthy have better schooling? Yeah. But as long as I'm allowing the kids who are poorer the same options, I'm okay with that. I think it's a better system now. Right now, the system is, is not working. You're seeing failures everywhere. You're seeing kids going to college not being prepared. For most kids who go to college now, the first year of college is 13th grade because they're not ready for it. They spent the last year of, of high school smoking weed, playing video games, and cutting class with study halls. And then it takes the average kid now six years to graduate college. And they have hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt. You know, one of the reasons why that is is because so much of our schooling is controlled by the federal government via funding. So federal funds come in, schools do what the federal government says, or sometimes state governments even, but often federal governments. And so now their incentives are not the right incentives. The incentives are, can I put my kids into college whether they should go to college or not? And can my kids pass a standardized test whether my kids need to pass that test or not? And maybe they should be tradespeople and maybe they should be going to college at age 18. This goes right back to my idea with, with healthcare. I wanna provide more options Keeping the, the government option there, it's fine. If, if my ideas are correct, and I believe they are, then people will go to my ideas and the government will do one of two things. It'll get better or that system will go away, but the community will have been there to, to help people because people need help. If I'm wrong and my ideas are bad, people will stay with the government option. It's optional, I'm not forcing anybody to do anything and I'm not getting rid of the government option. So the people over time decide that I'm right or that I'm wrong. Either way, no one is left out in the cold. I guess so. For the New York thing, are you saying that what they should do is they should just pool all the property taxes and then distribute it evenly to the kids that go to like where where kids go to school? Or I would I would rather it it come out of the the general fund. That's what I would rather it be. Sadly, mm -hmm. in the case of New York, it was supposed to come out of our lottery. Uh -huh. That went right to the general fund, and we stopped paying for it. I would rather us not use property taxes at all to pay for schooling. That would be my my preferred choice. Sure, but like, the, the, so the issue that I run into with a lot of these types of systems is what happens when you start building up these like wealthy areas where it's just like rich kids go to the good school, and then poor kids are like screwed, and they've got to go to the poor school. Like all the wealthy why, people send. Yeah, go ahead. Why would they have to? Right, it doesn't matter. You the amount of money that goes to your school is based on the bodies. That's all it would matter. So well, if, if there, you have a lot of kids if there's like a really good school, school though, what? Yep. Like, I mean, there's going to be like limited enrollment, right? Like, you can't have like twenty thousand kids go to the good school and there's like ten kids for each of the other schools, right? So if, it, if I if I don't have federal or state mandates on things like that, let the school grow if it can grow. If the school wants to grow, it would grow. If it doesn't want to grow, it won't. It'll decide what it wants to do. Why would I stop that? Why, why because would I think I it's prob because it's, that? It, it would probably be a better system if we could like grow our public institutions in such a way that like all the schools are better rather than you having like a super school that takes like 10,000 kids and all the other schools suck and if you can't move to the wealthy area then you're just kind of like out of luck. There, there are two things in this case I think and, and this is going to make most people who like more of a socialized um, uh, a socialized world they might like this. You look at the Swedish model right as an example. Mm -hmm. They don't district their kids, really. It's go to whatever school you want to go to, right? If you want to drive your kid two hours to a school, okay, go ahead. So what should happen, and I would hope it would, and I think you see this in certain areas now, is that when schools see there is an, uh, a group of people who will come to their school, which will get them more money, they'll create busing. They'll create ways of getting the kids to the school they don't, because they want more funds for their school, so they'll get, more, they'll get more funding. I think it will work out relatively well. But again, if it doesn't, then we can make moves and shifts at that point. Right now, it's failing. I don't want to measure my ideas against perfection. It's not gonna work. I wanna measure my ideas against status quo. Status quo is not working. And all I hear from the right is school choice. All I hear from the left is more money. I can't see either of those working. Yeah, I guess like when it comes to things like school or as we were talking about before, healthcare, um, I agree that like doing better than the status quo is important and we should look at how yeah. to improve these institutions. I just don't know why we would look for like novel solutions to these ideas when it seems like other countries have handled these ideas like already. Like uh, it seems like like other people obviously have problems with their healthcare systems, but in terms of like poor people not being able to afford medication, this seems to be largely an American problem. Like why would we would try agree. to why would we try to invent some novel solution to this when we could just copy like, oh, well, let's see what they do in every other first world country. 
Let's see what they do all over Western Europe. Like, let's just copy that. Let's do like a multi-payer or single-payer healthcare system. And then we can move on to like actually solving like new problems. Like if you like, if you work in like a, in like in like software development for computer stuff, right? Like if somebody's like, oh, like I need a I need a chat room made, right? You're not going to sit at your computer and build from scratch like a whole new chat room. You're going to go and say, oh, okay, well, let's see if there's like a solution that exists already. You copy paste it and then you modify it and then you start working on new problems. You wouldn't waste time like trying to reinvent the wheel and everything. I don't understand why as Americans sometimes we feel like we need to have like novel solutions to every problem, like like. I understand the desire to do like the free market stuff, but I, like it, it's, it sounds a little bit like when I argue with socialists where it's like, okay, well, this is a cool idea. Has it ever worked anywhere ever where it's ever been proposed or ever tried? And like, if it hasn't, it's like, okay, well, do we really want to be like the experimental grounds for this? Why can't we just copy something else that works and then move from there? I, I, in theory, I agree with what you're saying. The reality of it is Americans aren't going to do that. We don't want to, our culture says no, right? And people get mad at me when I talk about culture. Culture is what gets people to say yes, right? Culture is what gets, people to vote for the right people. Culture is what makes people actually make changes in their life. When we hear single payer, you just hear Americans scream. You hear Americans get upset. Americans can't even, they go nuts, right? They, it's, oh my God. So we're nowhere near doing that. I would like us to move to a level to where people feel comfortable enough to make a step, right? I want, I want an idea that is radical enough to make actual change and to make people excited but at the same time, familiar enough to where Americans go, oh, yeah, okay, I'll do that. Single payer is not that. I mean, I I would argue that we probably have been closer, probably even under FDR, we're probably been closer than any time in history, I would say, to getting like, a, I'm not a fan of single payer, I'm more a fan of a multi-payer system, but even for single payer, we're probably yes. closer to that than we ever have been. I mean, we were one Senate vote away um, Lieberman from having a public option. You know, we still have the ACA, you know, the expanded Medicaid across the states probably saved thousands of lives. Um, the ACA got, you know, over 10 million more people insured. You know, Biden wants to build on that. Um, I, I feel like we're a little bit warmer to the idea of these more kind of like public healthcare interventions. than I think we were at, at any point in our history. So why like totally step away from that now to start to go back to a system that left so many people behind before? It's a, it's a good, it's a good question. And I think it's just what I feel is you have so many, you have so, you have corporate, you have corporate capitalism right now, crony capitalism right now, where large organizations and, and, and old and, and oh, hold on one second. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm sadly with my, my audio, my people uh, that I'm doing live can't hear you. I apologize. I don't know why that's happening. Let me see if I can fix it real fast. Hold on one second. Oh, no problem. Hold on. Let me see if I can fix that real fast. See if that is possible. Hold on. Do you know what you're broadcasting with? What software? No, no, no it's not going to work. There we go. And we're good. All right, can you speak again? Yeah, hello. There we go. I'm hoping they can hear you now. I don't know if they can. If we can't, sorry guys, we'll just, uh, you can always head over to, uh, you can always head to, De to Destiny's YouTube. I'm sorry guys, you can always head over to Destiny's YouTube and watch it there. Mm -hmm. I apologize if my audio isn't working for you. Um, but let me let me go back to the to, to the other piece if if I could. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like with crony capitalism, the idea of us having actual change is slim to none without starting at a more localized state level. And why do I say that? We have tried so many times to make changes. We've tried with um, you know uh, we're gonna make we're gonna change um, our uh, our uh, funding of of elections. That hasn't worked. We're gonna try changing how we deal with uh, banking. That hasn't worked. We're gonna try to make it you know, better for, uh, for public companies. That hasn't worked. Almost every time we try to create these regulations at the, at the federal level, these regulations are written literally by corporate lobbyists. And the corporate lobbyists write rules that they can get around and they constantly do it. I really think this has to work, begin at a local county or state level for it to make the next step. I just, and maybe I'm wrong, right? I'm happy to be wrong if I am, mm -hmm. but I, I have not seen anything at the federal level actually do anything near what it was trying to do. 
we've been trying to, you know, somehow make it safer and better in theory, right, uh, with public companies. That hasn't worked at all. We've been trying to get money out of politics in theory. That hasn't worked at all. We've been trying to do, we've been passing laws in theory, credit, that isn't working, right? None of these things are working at the federal level. So I think at a local level is where you begin to test them, make them work. If they be, if people see value, then we bring it we bring it up from the local level to the federal level. Um, so in, in terms of like, so I, I see this is brought up a lot where people will say like, oh, well, it's really hard to get some things changed. And I agree with that, that it's hard, but yep. I don't think that that's a result of the system maybe partially i think it's just because a lot of these things are very 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 complicated um so for instance that's true yeah i don't know if you saw the whole memes with the game stocks or the GameStop stuff that happened and everybody getting upset Absolutely. at that um it, 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 it harkens back to me to occupy wall street um, i think a lot of people have very strong feelings sometimes about what to do about like a particular you know piece of legislation um, or, or like a particular, not, not piece of legislation, but like they ha people have an idea for um, what they want something to look like. And I think the way people, the way that people approach this is like, I want to start like a really big project. You know, I want to build a house and it should be easy. I just need a, a couple boards and maybe like a pipe for water or whatever. But then when you get down to actually doing it, it's like, okay, well, I, there's a lot of stuff that goes into this. Like I gotta, I've got to get water from the main. I got to like get sure. electricity. There's like so much stuff. And then you kind of get like bogged down in this area where it's like, okay, well, making these changes is actually really, really complicated. Um, and you, you, you can get a lot of people to agree that something needs to change. But when it comes time to figuring out what those changes look like, well, now we've completely divided against ourselves. I think a really good example of that, um, well, a really good example of that in real life is Brexit, um, where you know the, barely the country you know decided the UK is like, okay, well, we should leave. But then it's like, well, what should that leaving look like? And it's like, okay, wait, hold on. Now we don't even know if we want to do it anymore. Um, and I think it's similar when you look at things like, for instance, like public funding of elections. You know, um, people you know say like, I want to change the way that election funding works. Like, do you really? Like, well, what what is that going to look like? You know, if you ask any person on the internet or in real life, you know, what do you think about Citizens United? People will immediately. Um, you will immediately, you know, recoil and disgust. You're like Citizens United, horrible decision for the United States. But if you talk mm -hmm. about it for a couple minutes, that's a really hard decision. And the courts probably decided correctly on that. Um, you know, the idea that you can't advertise or make any type of material that may or may not support a particular candidate, you know, 60 days before an election, that's pretty crazy. Like, it's it's a really hard issue. And people will look at something and they'll think like, okay, well, we just need to make this so that it's like this. But then when you get into the weeds of how to do it, well, it's it's a lot harder to figure out what those precise changes are. Um, so I'm only pointing to that. So when you say like, oh, you know, well, we failed to, to change the funding of elections. We failed to change how our banking is. We failed to do public companies or whatever. I don't know if we so much as failed so much as like, we don't really have like a consensus around how this should be done, which makes the change pretty slow because a lot of these issues are so complicated. People don't really know how they should look, which I think um, points to the strength of the ACI even more because despite all of the complicatedness surrounding healthcare, um, I think the ACI was successful in that it got more people insured. Now it hasn't done anything to, help the rising costs of healthcare. Yeah, um, that's we, true. Mm -hmm, uh, we, although that partially is due to the fact that like Medicare, for instance, is restricted in terms of being able to negotiate for drug prices, you know, stuff that other um, multi-payer or single-payer systems around the world do have the ability to do is to set drug prices. Um, so, the, and then the idea that like there's been no social program that has ever been like successful, I would argue things like social security, Medicare, Medicaid. I think these are- I, the post I, I didn't say it was successful. Please, uh, that's not what I'm saying. Oh, okay. Sorry, I, I, I'm, I'm not. I'm, I'm, look, I know a lot of libertarians talk constantly about get rid of this, get rid of that, get rid of this, get rid of that. It's not what I've ever brought up. I've talked about poverty. I did a, I did a presentation on Queens College on poverty, and I try to show better ways of making, of, of alleviating po poverty without a war on poverty, without a, without a, a, a war on drugs, without government stepping in and giving out money. I've, come up with ideas for that. Mm -hmm. I've, I've literally, you know, spoken about that more than once. Um, this is the time, I, I, on my uh, Sharpway YouTube page, I literally have a, I literally have a link that's, uh, it's it's cheesy, but I'm a dad, so it was a dad joke. Mm -hmm. I said, I can't feel the burn, maybe it's not sharp enough. And it's literally me going down Bernie Sanders uh, policy page and giving libertarian ideas to achieve the same things that, you know, people who like Bernie want. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm trying to achieve. I think we can do it this way because I think it will begin to actually move the ball forward. I do not see at all 
it happening any other way. What I see happening, if you look at what's happening now, is the left is going deeper left, the right is going deeper right, nothing is getting changed. The the left has become the, the party of, of, of one side of a culture war and the right the other side of a culture war and nothing is getting fixed. I'm trying to actually get things done. And while my ideas are not perfect, they coming up with a, an odd or different idea actually is something that will make people think. People are still excited. And you know, I crossed New York State and I, I didn't do anywhere near as well as I wanted to do when I ran, but I did far better than anyone else who'd ever run a New York State and Libertarian Party by, by far. I did far better than anyone else had done. And one of the reasons was I had interesting ideas like regulating cannabis like onions, mm -hmm. right? Things like that, that made people think, oh, that's, that's radical enough to be different, but I still understand it. This is what I'm trying to achieve. The idea of, of, of any of that single payer or monopoly, I don't want to replace one monopoly with another. We already have cartel systems everywhere. We have cartel systems in, our, in, in almost everything we do. I want more Davids, less Goliaths. I don't see any party or group doing that. I only see libertarians even caring about that. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess we could go on to like individual policies. You're going to talk about that. Um, I mean, the regulating cannabis and selling that is obviously a really good idea, but I don't think we need libertarians to give us that idea. It seems like there are already a multitude of states that have voted um, to legalizing, you know, marijuana and uh, even even past like um, past medical use. Um, but if you want to talk about like any individual or particular policy for something sure, like that, then, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'll, I'll walk down that road right now. Mm -hmm. Right. What that what legalizing cannabis in most states has done. Mm -hmm is still ensure that there is a black market in cannabis, right? That's that's what I'm trying to avoid. General rule that my team and I put together when we started talking about Wait, can cannabis, you say that legalizing it has made a black market? The way we've legalized it, we've ensured there that there is still a black market. Uh, just because a state legalizes it doesn't mean they legalize it in a way that makes the black market go away. And what I want to do is I want to try to do my best to end the black market, right? That's what I want to try to do. To the best of my ability, I want to try to end the black market. Generally speaking, the, more, the harder your licensing is, the more the more restrictions you put on people who are felons being part of the industry, uh, the higher you tax it, the more you create a black market. You know, in New York State, for a medical marijuana license, you had to have two hundred and ten thousand dollars to distribute. Oh my God, how are you going to find that kind of money? You know what winds up happening? Wealthy people wind up having either hedge funds or they wind up having some kind of holding company and they start doing it. And the local farmer gets screwed and the local dealer gets screwed. The local dealer, it just stays as a dealer. That's, he, does, he doesn't do anything. So you want to make sure when you legalize it, well, I said regular, like onions, because if you want to grow onions in your backyard, mm -hmm. you can go ahead and grow onions in your backyard. If you're poor or you don't have that much money and you would rather grow your medicine for your chronic back pain or whatever issue you have for your medicine or your PTSD, grow in your backyard if you want to. If you don't, you can buy it cheaply from your dealer, right? My idea was if you if you like your dealer, keep your dealer, why not? If you make it to where the only thing you have to do is become legal, all your dealer has to do now is, you know, spend 45 bucks or whatever it is in your state to become an LLC and he or she can keep dealing. That's a good thing. Now they can get insurance, E and O. They don't have to carry a stick or a gun around. They can actually call the cops if someone robs them. All of a sudden, it becomes a legalized market. You don't need, you don't need street justice. Not a fight anymore. You know, I don't need to have attack dogs in my house. None of that stuff's required anymore. But when you start to do it the way they did with so much money, those guys stay illegal, mm -hmm. and the price becomes so expensive, people still buy it illegally. So you retain a black market. So you're right in that many states are legalizing it, but they're legalizing it so that the cronies can get their cut. So that big business still gets all their money and the little guy is still cut out. I would rather I mean, have it to where it's a cr cash crop for small farmers. And the example I'll give you is in New York State, we allowed some regulations to be removed on breweries. And in New York State, we, we had a, a big explosion in local small breweries in New York State. Entrepreneurs stepped up. People started doing that. And I wanted us to have you know, cash local grows, right? Have that same thing. I think that's the way to legalize or to decriminalize cannabis. The way we're doing it now is not a good idea. It, it retains a black market. Sure. I, I mean, there probably needs to be some sort of regulation or restriction on stuff that you're selling like that, though, right? Like, yeah, maybe you make it 18 years or older. 
That's fine. Sure. What else? But what, I mean, like I mean, look, any 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 type of literally any type of restriction or regulation is probably going to induce some type of black market, though, right? Like that's yes, going to be but true. If you of, just did mm -hmm. eighteen years or older, as an example, mm -hmm. the black market would be minuscule. It would just be the people who want to sell to kids. That would be it. That's mm -hmm. your only black market at that point. While that's still a terrible black market, but if I'm going to send my police force into people's homes or neighborhoods, I'd rather send them in to stop it getting sold to kids. If I'm going to use them for that, use them for that. That's a good reason to use cops to stop kids from getting drugs. I'm okay with that. Okay. Right. Use them for that. But I don't want to use them to not kick in your door because they don't like the number of plants you have in your house. In New York State, I think you only have, can have three plants. If you have more than three plants, they can kick in your door. Mm -hmm. And they don't even have to have a warrant in New York State for that. That's how, how we're regulating it now. We're creating a an office of cannabis management because it's so critical to, to, to regulate cannabis. Why? In the black market that cannabis is in now and has been for centuries, we don't have any deaths due to cannabis. So now that it's legalized, we require a board. That's what I'm talking about. That's the kind of stuff we're doing in all states. There's no requirement for a board. There's no requirement for this. Is there a is, is there an onion board that stops you from selling onions? Of course not. Now you're saying, I might, Larry, I might want quality control. Great, you have quality control with any food or product that you know people put into their bodies. Keep the same quality control for that, and all of a sudden now what begins to happen is people will still be able to win. The little guy can win. I want the little guy to win. I want the local community to be able to win. And with the way we're doing it now, it's not happening. All those people in Colorado who went, who the, there was a big homeless um, uh, boom in, in Colorado mm -hmm. when they legalized cannabis, because so many of the people who were in other states, they believed, sadly, that they can go to Colorado and get into that industry. They, many of them had criminal records, and they thought they can go in there, work in the industry, get their life turned around, get a second chance at life. And what did the government do? They said, no, 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 you had to be here a year, you got to pay the fees. So they got there and they had nothing. And they went to the black market, they became homeless, all kind of problems. Now that isn't the only reason they had a homeless problem, but that was a big chunk of it. So you don't talk about policies? Yeah, that's the policy I want. I don't want big government involved in something like that. I want the little guy to win. And what I would argue is every time we start to, to regulate something like that, by default, we become crony capitalists, by default, we start helping out the big guys, and by default, regulatory capture becomes the norm. Sure. So, I mean, I can agree with you that there might be uh, undue restrictions on selling cannabis, that maybe it is too heavily regulated in some areas. I mean, that's that's probably the case. I've, I've heard as much in terms of um, the restrictions that go into sending these shops up, especially down in California. Um, I, I wouldn't be opposed to rolling back some of those, obviously, to make it so that they could be more competitive. Um, that being said, uh, even if we get through all of those stages and even if we accomplish all of that, I, I don't know where we get this idea of like the little guy ever winning against big business. Like just by the virtue of how economics works, is that's just, that's never gonna happen, right? Like even if you Why have- Why do you think that's never gonna happen? Because, because big businesses are always going to have like massive advantages over small people, except for in very, very, very niche industries. Like that's just a- And that's my entire point. You create many niche, niche industries. That's exactly my point, yes. Well, but like in terms, but not everything can be a niche industry. So for instance, cannabis is not a niche industry, right? Like there's gonna be- Well, not anymore it isn't. Well- It could have been. Well, how? Like if, assuming you make it legal, there's always going to be massive movers that want to get involved in that. And a massive yep. operation is always going to be able to outproduce yep. and outcompete like smaller individuals, no matter what mm -hmm. kind of anything is set up. And what I would say is, look look right now, and again, I'll go back to New York, our brewery industry. Um, there are many huge brewers, right? I mean, huge. Anheuser-Busch is massive, right? I don't know who makes Coors Light, so what makes, massive, it's huge. I don't even know the company that does it, but they're massive. Mm -hmm. Yet somehow the industry began to explode. Wine, it's a niche industry. Lots of local people have you know, wine, and then they're able to make good money and, and explode. So. I do think there are many examples of little guy growing and getting bigger and badder and people jumping into those fields. I think you absolutely can do it if you have the right environment. Look, I grew up in a poor neighborhood in the Bronx. And I remember when I was a kid in the Bronx growing up, most of the people, I grew up in the 70s. And when I grew up in the 70s in the Bronx, I remember kids and people making money as entrepreneurs constantly. 
I remember them braiding hair on the sidewalk to make money. And right now in New York State, you want to braid hair, you have to get a license for that. It'll cost you $20,000 to braid hair. I'm not joking. If you walk a dog in New York City, you require a license to walk a dog. That's the types of things that I keep talking about. That's what crushes the little guy. Those are the things. These are all ideas that are, oh, it's about safety. It's not about safety. Who are the people dying from hair braiding? Nobody is. It's a fantasy. That is just more regulatory capture by large businesses who keep doing that. If you have a, if you have a government that says, where's the harm? There's no harm. Stop. But we don't have that. Our government is like, oh, let's keep doing this. And my point is you have to make an, an idea to where you have to have an ideology that says, let's just let people be people. And we don't have that. Yeah, That's so, how it needs to explode. Again, I, I understand that like occupational licensing is, I, it seems to be pretty dumb in a lot of areas. Like I don't disagree yes. with that. Um, yep. But again, one, I I don't think we need to be a libertarian to say that. I think that a lot of people should be able to agree with that from across oh, the Oh, no, aisles. no, you have to. And then, no, no, no one else says that but libertarians, my friend. There's not a Democrat or Republican that I hear in my state saying what I just said. So in my state, you've got to be libertarian. Okay. All right. Maybe in New York. I don't know uh, in New York State if what every politician says. So that might be the case. But um, yes. I, I've I've heard colloquially speaking, I've heard a lot of people um, talk about how occupational licensing is is pretty bad. I, I've even heard challenges to um, the amount of medical training that doctors receive as being prohibitive and unnecessary um, in terms of yes. like how many years of med school and everything are required for that. Um, that uh, I, it might be the case in New York that maybe the only people talking about this are libertarians. But um, I, I I agree that like occupational licensing could be bad. Um, however, again. Even if we got rid of all occupational licensing, like craft beer is like an interesting thing to bring up. Like, I'm sure that we can find certain kind of like niche things where people are willing to pay more um, because of the nichenessness of it. Um, so, for instance, like if you're a musician, um, you probably don't want to buy a saxophone or a guitar from Walmart. You probably want to go to a specialty shop down the street or whatever. Uh, but for the vast majority, for 90 percent of the products that are moved in this country, I don't think that most people are going to are, are going to want to go to a small business to get this. Like it's going to be large corporations that are always going to be the major movies in these. So, for instance, if we're talking about buying and selling food or clothes yep. or automobiles like there is even if we got rid of all the regulations and all the everything in the world. World, the large businesses are still always going to outcompete um, the smaller individuals or smaller firms. It's just a fact of life. And if you ever did find that, the, and the paradox about this is that if you ever did find a small business that was able to find some way to outcompete these larger guys, well, that small business would inevitably grow into a big business and then it would become yep. the next big business, right? Uh, I, yes. I, oftentimes I hear, um, I hear a lot of people talk about when we talk about small businesses, people oftentimes hold up this, this uh, what I would consider a fantasy of this idea that like we can do things to help small business owners and we can do things to help the small guy be able to compete and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, I, I just, I don't think that that just can't happen. It's just, it's never going to be the case except in very niche industries like maybe craft, you know, craft beer, um, which I, I'm willing to bet after the coronavirus and everything i'm willing to bet that a lot of these breweries are probably having a lot of problems in new york right now um, and probably don't have the capital in hand to sustain themselves through um, the coronavirus stuff and everything and then coming out of it um, it might be the case that you can do some things to help you know some very very niche small businesses but the majority of things are always just going to be run by people that have you know larger supply chains larger corporations um, more national or even international presence that's just a fact of life i think that we have to kind of live with so are, are you saying then that there's no hope is that what you're saying? Don't don't bother, don't bother trying to stop the behemoth. Don't bother trying to stop the Leviathan. Just allow them to run roughshod because we have no chance. I, yeah, I just, so I think I that. Yeah, it's like so. I mean, like, let's say there's like, I mean, like, if there's a river flowing somewhere, you know, we can get mad at the river all you want and complain about it and tell it to stop flowing, or we can set up, you know, like a, a turbine inside of it and set up like a water wheel and, and get power off of it. Um, I mean, like, big businesses are always going to be the dominating force in any economic system. That's just a fact of life. It's just a comparative advantages and everything. Like, they're always going to be the, yes. the biggest. So I think it's good to like recognize, like, well, what are the advantages? You know, um, the things that you brought up earlier as your example of successful companies, you're not listing any local businesses 
when you talk about like FedEx, UPS, or Amazon Prime, right? These are massive corporations that have been able yep. to deliver these products because of their national presence. Um, and I think it's important to recognize that that's a fact of the world. Um, let's not delude ourselves into thinking that a small mom and pop shop is going to become competitive with Amazon. And instead, let's figure out like, what are the appropriate tax structures we need for these companies to keep them honest, to keep our social programs funded, and let's move forward there. That's a more realistic path forward rather than the idea that like every small business is suddenly going to become competitive with big businesses overnight just because we get rid of, you know, like occupational licensing or other forms of government regulation. Well, look, all the big businesses at one point were small businesses. So clearly they all became great. If you go back, say, 30 years, as an example, I'm not sure exactly, but in that area, all the top companies that are top companies now weren't. Many of them didn't even exist 30 years ago. You know, probably most of them, 40 years, didn't exist at all. Um, but they were at least small, if not that. So I don't think that's true. What I'd like to do is create a cycle to where big businesses grow and collapse and small businesses come up. And that's a normal cycle that we should do. That's what I want to, to foster more than anything. And sadly, I feel we're moving to a point to where right now, if you look at financing, for example, or brand new businesses, as an example, in most cases, you find so many people starting businesses with only one goal. To sell to, be, to a bigger. Yes. Yeah. That's a bought. huge problem. I agree with you. It's really yes. silly. Mm -hmm. to be bought. And most of that happens because once you start to get bigger, it becomes harder. One of the rules I wanted to put in play in New York State, was, which is similar to one in Wyoming. Wyoming, if not mistaken, is for farmers, if I, if I got it right. It may have changed, but when I was running, it was true. If you were a farmer in Wyoming and you agreed that you would sell only to within Wyoming, you were immune from all federal regulatory bodies, right? Once you decided to sell outside of Wyoming, you then had to then, of course, abide by federal regulatory bodies. Mm -hmm. So I think in New York State, as I mentioned, we should have that for any small business that agrees that will sell only within New York State. You're immune from regulatory, any, any federal regulatory bodies. That gives you an advantage, number one. But two, some people will, will decide, you know what? I like staying small. I don't want to become that big guy ever. I'm happy being that local guy who just services your lawnmowers or sells you you know, your uh, your meat and potatoes or whatever is the thing that matters, right? They're mm -hmm. gonna be happy to just do that. So you do that, you encourage people to be local, right? You're going to encourage that. And the small people can still survive. Go to most small towns in America today. Most of them, uh, want, they have one big thing, like they have a, a college or a prison or, you know, or a factory. They have one big thing in the town and then everything else is some form of franchise, some form of franchise, whether it's a gas station, a fast food joint, you know, whatever, it's some, uh, an H&R block, it's some form of franchise. Why do franchises, why are they so popular in America? Now, I'm not against franchises. In many cases, they're very valuable for people who, who want to grow a small business, particularly those who, you know, like some kind of structure, it's not a bad idea. Mm -hmm. But they're everywhere, because franchises are basically big business. They, they, they have the massive lobbyists, they have the lawyers, they have the HR, they have all the things required. The little guys simply can't compete with. They can buy in bulk, as you mentioned earlier. They can do all of those things, right? The, the issue that I wanna do is I wanna make it to where the competition is from the local person. Some people will stay small. Some will be able to prep themselves to grow bigger. I would rather that be the case. So I probably already know the answer to this. So my question would be then, why is it that you don't see all of these small competitive businesses popping up everywhere um, if like so many people would prefer to remain local? Like why is it that we don't see those businesses coming up more and being more successful? I, I think we do see them come up and then they get smashed down. Why? I think we see them come up and then they get smashed down. That's the problem, they do come up. Lots of people start new businesses. But I don't know if you know this, but last time I checked, this is probably in the area of around 2012-ish or so, mm -hmm. and this tends to be pretty similar. About 80% of all small businesses collapse within five years. Sure. And then the, another 80% of those collapse another five years. Sure. So generally speaking, small businesses fail. Those numbers are higher than ever now. Why? Because it's so hard. It's hard to, one, I, I tease people when people start businesses here in New York State, and they go, hey, Larry, I'm gonna hire somebody now. And I say, awesome, that's great, you can hire somebody. Now the punishment begins. And the government begins to punish you immediately. The government does not support the gig economy. 
which is the way many people are going to start making a living in the future the, and people are going to change the, the, the way they work. The average person in America, if you're a youngster, you're, say, 20 or in that area, mm -hmm. you're probably going to have five different careers in your life, five different careers, not jobs, careers. How are you going to learn a different career? Odds are the gig economy. You're going to do some jobs here or there, learn something new, change and shift. You might go back to school, but probably not. But you might. You might go back to school nowadays. That kind of thing is possible. But the odds are you're not going to. Government goes out of its way to crush that. So, again, the little guy can't get up and running. Right. You have to, as I just said, if you want to walk a dog in New York City, you've got to have a license. Braid here, you got to have a license. Right. And that's a common thing. That's crushing small businesses. Of course it is. You get it. This is what happens. And, I, and I'm assuming it happens in your state, too. But I could be wrong. Once you hire an employee, immediately New York State assumes that you were a bad person and begins to write you notes that you owe them money. I'm not joking. Ask anyone who's sort of business, you get, a, you get a bill. You owe us money. You owe us money. Now, if you're savvy, you have an accountant, and the accountant takes that and goes, don't worry about it. This is New York State. New York State assumes you're guilty. I got you. Don't worry about it. But if you're not savvy, you begin to negotiate with the state. And the state will negotiate with you, even though you don't actually owe the money. Once you say you owe the money, the state will go, oh, good, you agree you owe the money? Great. And they'll start to negotiate with you. So now you're writing a check for two, three, four, five thousand dollars that you didn't have in the first place. What is, it what is the IOU for? What do you owe them for? They'll say things like, well, you, you, you're, you are working in the business, therefore you owe workers comp. And you don't if you are a sole proprietor. You don't. It's just not true. Mm -hmm. But they'll say that. They'll, they'll, you'll get a note for that. You'll get a note saying that you owe you owe money for um, for uh, um, uh, for either workers comp or for um, unemployment insurance, whether or not you have full time or part time employees, and you only owe if you have full time employees. But they'll still send it anyway. The note will come regardless. The second you put your EIA your EIN, which is uh, for those of you who don't know, that's your that's your number that says you're a business. You're basically the equivalent of your business social security number. Once you send it out they come out right after you. This is the kind of thing I'm talking about that small businesses get hammered with. You, what they'll do is they'll create a regulation and the regulation will say, okay, if you do something, whatever the bad thing is, um, then um, you, the fine is $10,000. Mm -hmm. And they'll say, well, the fine is $10,000 because there's a possibility of harm. So we should punish these businesses and they should pay $10,000. Well, what winds up actually happening? The, the the rule of regulation isn't really an important regulation anyway. It'll be something like, and I'm not make, I, I'm just I'm giving this up as an example. You know, when your burgers are on the counter being ready to be fried, they have to be at 40 degrees um, um, Fahrenheit. Mm -hmm. That's that's the type of regulation there is. I don't know if that's the actual number, but there is a there is regulation like that. So now yours is at 42. That's a several thousand dollar fine. Well, what does McDonald's or some large corporation do? They collect all their fines at the end of the year. They then go to the city and negotiate. Hey, we owe you $4 million in fines. We'll pay you a million dollars. Be quiet. The city goes, great, thanks. Takes a million dollars, walks away. That's what happens if you're a, if a franchise or a large organization. If you're a small organization, they say, give us $10,000. If you don't, we're going to shut you down. So the small guy gets killed. Well, the franchise doesn't. If New York City, if you see the UPS truck drivers and such, they get tickets all the time. You'll see sometimes two, three, four tickets. What do they do? At the end of the year, they negotiate with New York City and write them a check. But what if you're a local guy, an owner operator? You get two or three tickets, you're screwed. That's how that works again and again and again. I would like that to not be the case. Leave so I guess alone. like what, so I guess to think of the example of like the fines for the burgers on the counter. Do you want that sure. regulation to disappear completely, or do you just want like larger corporations to not be able to negotiate away a fine? No. What I want is the rule to be: if you harm somebody, you have to pay. Not whether the hamburger is at forty degrees or not. Did you harm somebody? Did someone get sick? Did someone complain? Did somebody die? Did something bad happen? You see large corporations, they will literally do stuff that will people will die. They'll be killed and they will say, we admit no wrongdoing. Why? Because they followed the regulations that their corporate lobbyists wrote. So since they follow the regulations, they say, I've done no harm. So they pay some fee to some lawyers in a class action lawsuit. The people who got hurt seven years later get four dollars, ninety two cents. The lawyers make a bazillion dollars and they say, I've done no I've done no harm because I followed the rules. Because the crime is not against the individual, the crime is against the state. I would rather it be if you have a burger joint and you give someone food poisoning, 
You owe them. That's assault. That's a problem. Pay them. Fix this. Don't pay the state because what happens is now enforcement is a profit center. I don't want enforcement to be a profit center. Enforcement should be for safety. Now it's a profit center. So now you have you have many uh, organizations. You'll probably you probably heard this if you know people who have restaurants. The second the health inspector comes in, they simply throw all the food in the garbage. I'm not joking. They take all the food from the garbage because it's cheaper to rebuy the food than to pay the fines that he will find by, by default. And it's the thing they also do here. Small business owner has to try to survive. The health inspector comes in. I'm not making this up. It's a story I heard more than once. They drop several hundred dollars on the floor, meaning the owner, mm -hmm. and he picks it up and he asks a question. He says, I'm sorry, I just found this on the floor. Is this yours? If the inspector says yes, he leaves. But it says no, he stays. You're increasing corruption. You're encouraging corruption. You're encouraging pain. And, and you're attacking little guys. There's no tomorrow. This is my problem. I want to make it to where if you hurt someone, pay for them. You hurt them. I don't want the crime to be against the state. I don't want enforcement to be a profit center because what winds up happening is now the state becomes predatory. What happened during COVID? The state made a bunch of rules for COVID and they were random. And this happened all over the whole country. If you're if you're you're a, a bar, you have to close here or have this percentage or do this thing, whatever the thing was, and it would change literally every month. But not just that. They will now send their agents out to now collect and now attack bars and clubs that were already getting destroyed, restaurants that were already being crushed. So the so the county saw this and said, Whoa, you guys are coming in and you're robbing our people. We don't like that. You can't rob our people. We rob our people. And then they created their own rules and regulations at the county level. And then those rules and regulations did not match at all. So now a local bar or restaurant has an option. Do I let the county rob me or do I let the state rob me? Which one? Because I can't follow both. And that was happening constantly to where people just said, I'm going to shut down. I just I can't handle this. And again, this goes back to the same thing. So, the state becomes predatory. Yeah, so I, I, I can't speak to the difference between state and county rules for the coronavirus stuff in New York because I, I just don't know. In terms of talking about how like we should ease up on regulations and just enforce people that end up doing um, that end up actually harming people or doing damage, um, it seems to me that one of the big problems that we have as humans is, and then as business owners and as capital investors, is people don't usually prepare well for like very rare circumstances or what they think might be rare circumstances. Yep. So if we were to, to decide to do that, let's hypothetically like, okay, we're going to get rid of all of our restrictions on um, food storage or whatever, or temperatures of like how long could something sit for room temperature on a counter or whatever, right? Um, if we were to start doing stuff like that, um, it, it seems like there might be some businesses that would still be proactive about it, but a lot of businesses would probably stop caring as much. And then more people would get food poisoning. Maybe businesses would get fined. Maybe someone would go to business. Maybe it'd be hard. I mean, it can probably be hard. I don't even know how you would go about proving food poisoning. I guess unless multiple people got poisoned from the same place. Um, it seems like in cases like this, I think that the, uh, I feel like, I feel like a really good real world application of this is, are you familiar with like what happened with the Texas power grid? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so like that was an example where everybody was like, okay, well, we're going to let the free market decide. Um, you know, you can buy power from individual people or, or individual companies. They're all going to compete on the grid. They're going to all offer you the best price. And that's going to be the way that we're going to go forward. And one thing that we discovered is for that model, they were very, very, very ill-equipped to deal with disaster. When something came up, everybody was just completely flabbergasted and we just didn't have the preparations in place. And I feel like before that argument would have happened, um, the standard kind of like free market, laissez-faire, libertarian argument would have been like, well, you see what will happen is at least one person will prepare for that disaster because when it happens, they're going to be very highly compensated for it. And that means that other people are going to be incentivized to do it as well because it's going to be money there and people are going to pay them if a natural disaster happens, blah, 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 blah. And that might be like in a hypothetical world where everybody is like a hyper perfect rational actor and they're all doing their you know risk assessment perfectly. But <clears throat> in the real world, it doesn't happen, right? People will hardcore maximize for the short term term or short medium term and they don't always look ahead to like potential disasters and so i feel like when we talk about like getting rid of all regulations and just punishing people that do things that or getting rid of a lot of regulations just punish people that end up doing harm to people rather than just enforcing a regulation i feel like you're going to have a lot more of that harm committed because people are just pretty bad at prioritizing how we you know deal with risk i think it's a valid point so what i would say is instead of saying i would turn regulations instead to guidelines so you want to have guidelines, right? I, I don't, you might want to say, look, your your hamburger should be at 40 degrees or whatever the case may be. We recommend this is what the government says, so we should do. And then 
require the businesses to hold insurance. You require them. That's a requirement. Do you have enough insurance that if you do something stupid that you can that you can deal with that issue? Two things will happen. Number one, insurance companies will eventually do some type of inspection, which is fine. I don't mind that at all. The insurance companies will, of course, do that because they don't want to pay out when people do dumb things. The second thing you would do is once you have the insurance company doing inspections, when the insurance company starts paying out, they may even have their own rules and regulations that if you want to get insured, you have to do this and do that. And if people don't do the things, then they can't get insured. And if they can't get insured, then they can't have a restaurant. So the insurance companies would literally wind up shutting down the restaurants by default. Yeah, but now it seems like we've insured. just now we've just moved the problem down the road, though, to where it used to be the predatory state was shutting businesses down. And all of the same problems you talked about before, where you drop $100 and the inspector would be like, oh, wow, cool. Well, instead of a state inspector, now it's just going to be like an insurance guy. No, don't we have the same problem? No, I, we, ha we have a problem still. It isn't the perfect system, but the difference is it's in the insurance company's best interest to make sure that he doesn't crush that business because he wants the business to stay and keep paying premiums. So it has a, a better incentive. That's the, the same of like the, the state no, too though, right? Yeah, you want all. businesses to stay in business so that nope. they can. If that were true, we wouldn't have shut our entire state down for COVID. Absolutely not true. No way. Well, but it, the, there's other incentives the, as well. It's the not individual is incent The individual bureaucrat is incentivized by collecting cash. The individual bureaucrat is that, that is predatory is a profit center. They must collect money from the people and the businesses. That's their goal, and they are judged <laughs> often monthly, if not quarterly. Often, for sure, yearly. I, I, don't, I don't think be bureaucrats, quarterly. but bureaucrats, it's not like they make more money. It's not like if I'm a state enforcer or whatever, if I like bust, you know, like certain restaurants, I'm going to see like 20% of like the fine is going to be like sent to my bank account or something. No, like I feel no, like the insurance company would be way more incentivized um, than, than any bureaucrat in, in terms of like punishing people or whatever. No. No, the insurance company the opposite. If anything, the insurance company would be would be more lenient, and that might be a problem, right? The insurance company might be more lenient because the insurance company wants them is going to make its money based upon premiums. It's not going to make its money based upon fines and fees. So the individual bureaucrat, you're right. They don't say, "Oh, guys, you know what? Um, because you brought in a hundred bucks, here's an extra twenty in your pocket." Of course not. But if you're a bureaucrat and your job as an inspector is to go out and to collect cash. If you don't collect a certain amount of cash, I am going to pressure you. And what example do I have of this? Look at all the sting operations that 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 um, you know local liquor authorities, state liquor authorities use. They're they're creating problems with Arizona. And, and ask anyone who's a bar owner who you might know, and you'll show up either seen or heard or actually watched something like this where three people come in a bar. True story I heard, uh, and, and somebody else was there, so unless both were lying to me. So I believe it's true because two people both co uh, corroborated it. So three people come into a bar. The bartender does his job. He asks for ID. The young lady shows her ID, and the two men show their ID. The young lady is not of age. She's only 20, not 21. The bartender says, I can't, I'm sorry, I, I, can't, I can't let you drink the beer. I apologize. I can't do it. It's against the law. She goes, okay, okay, I won't drink it. Can I just pay for these two guys? He goes, fine. He gives two guys the beer. He's fine because the rule is she can't purchase it. I that's mean, that sounds law. that's that sounds fair, though, right? Like, that's what the that's law is, fair. no? Yeah. It is. No, no, it's the law and it's bogus. Why would they? There's no crime. Who was harmed by that? The three people who were there were all state agents. No one, the woman who was under 21 didn't drink the beer. So no one was harmed. This was a sting operation to punish the bar because they were trying to collect money. Are Do you, you think if some, this, if I'm, this I'm, was real? Sure. Okay. So I'm, cu real. I'm curious in terms of how, how far we take this. So let's say somebody manages to um, become incredibly inebriated and they drunk drive from a bar to a house. As long as they don't get in an accident, should they not be fined for it? No, I think they should. I, no, that, that to me is obvious harm. I, how, I, how is I, it harm I'm, if they don't crash into anybody or hurt anybody? What's like it, the the example would be: What if someone had a firearm? They had it loaded, finger and trigger, and were flashing it around um, in a bar. I think that's a line I don't want to cross. Now, is is that gray? You're right; it's a gray area, and we have to draw a line somewhere. In my view, and some people disagree. There are libertarians who disagree with me completely on this. Well, I but guess in like my yeah, go ahead. View, this is an obvious problem. You're you're out there with a car and you're drunk you are a threat. This is threatening. You're threatening other people. That's my view. 
I Many libertarians disagree with me. I, yeah, but I guess so. I, I guess totally, I'm on your side. I think yes, of I, course that's a problem. I, I guess then the issue wouldn't necessarily. I lost your sound again. Can you hear me? Testing one two one two. Is this me? There we go. Now I got you. Oh, can you hear me? One two one two. Yep. Now I got you. I okay. don't know what I did. Now I got you all of a sudden. Gotcha. Do you know? My, my guess is that something is like connecting and disconnecting for your computer and every time it connects discord is sending all the audio there That's my guess for what's happening. Ah, uh, That makes sense That absolutely does make sense. Yep. That makes sense. I think you're I think you are correct. Okay. Gotcha. Let's see what's happening Let me see if I can fix that. Okay. There we go. All right. I, th I think we're good. Okay All right. Sorry about that. Yeah, no problem. Um, so yeah, so I guess in terms of like the in terms of like the drunk driving thing, so we would say that like even if you don't get into an accident, you ought to be punished for drunk driving. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I guess it sounds like for the twenty-one year old, twenty year old thing, um, the issue that you had there wasn't their way of enforcing that kind of law or fine. You just think that that particular law is dumb, then, right? It's not really the enforcement part. You have a problem with there. It's that if you're no, twenty, no, 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 should, no, no. The way it's enforced, right? In this case, the incentive for the the state liquor association, the, the the incentive is for them to go and collect. That's their incentive. So they create a sting operation where there is no one who's actually harmed. Again, the three people there are all state agents, right? Yeah. The woman's actually over twenty one. She has a fake ID to try to fool the guy. Well, do we think that she like does, our sting operation drink anyway? Yeah, our sting operations always bad then. Um, not always. If there if there is a sting operation because there is an actual person, right? If say they believed because someone said that this this guy or gal was serving people underage, mm -hmm. then maybe you have a state agent come in and see someone who's younger, and literally just stay there and watch and see does he do it? Does he not do it? Check her ID. There's actual harm. Punish the guy. Absolutely. 100%. Well, but I mean, like that's my you're never going to all three was state agents. I just I don't understand what the problem is with that. It seems like this is like standard practice, even in private industry. You test people like this. So um, I have a little bit of food background. Um, I don't know if this term is ubiquitous throughout the industry, but we used to call them secret shoppers. I don't even, Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. So you have like a random guy comes in. Usually it's like a, I think it's usually like a third party that's hired by the corporation. They come in yep. and they have like an experience in your restaurant and then they kind of like evaluate you based on what happens. Um, I mean, that just seems pretty standard practice across like everything um, where you, I, I've done it myself. I yeah. have been that person. I've done it for other industries where I act as I act as a as a consultant. I mm -hmm. would come as the consultant. I'm the secret shopper. If that makes any sense, mm -hmm. I would do it, of course. But yeah, so that like sting that sting operation is done internally, meaning that the companies want it to be done. They're not going to punish, but I mean, they're not going to all of a sudden get shut down or fined. They're now going to fix their own internal policies because they want to be better. That's a whole different way of saying, I'm going to be predatory and come after your business. Well, but that's like, but the reason why we have to have those restrictions is because companies aren't going to be incentivized to the more moral action here. So for instance, like if you have a bar, it would be nice if you could sell to people that are under 21. It's more customers. It would be nice. I agree. It'd be so, nice. So they're incentivized to do something that might not be like in the best interest of the public health, right? We could talk about yep. like the coronavirus related lockdowns as well, like where it's kind of bad for business, but um, the incentive there isn't supposed to be for making money. It's supposed to be for sure. some other um, thing that we're serving. So it, it would seem like having these sting operations to enforce rules or regulations, I think in general would be good. I think I, it feels to me, I, uh, maybe we're just not connecting here, like I would only get upset if these sting operations were done against things that I consider to be like stupid laws. Um, so for instance, like I, so I disagree with a lot of like speed limit related stuff in the US and it seems like 95% of drivers do. Um, that's why, you know, it's like, oh, like the first thing you ask anytime you're on a new freeway or a new highway is you're like, okay, how much can I speed here without them pulling me over? You know, if it's right, more 60, sure. you can go 70, 75 maybe. Yeah. Um, but like, yeah, so like when you've got like speed traps set up that are writing people tickets for going, you know, 60 and a 55, it's like, okay, well, this is dumb. But it's not because the officer's running a speed trap. It's because we consider like this type of, like laws dumb so like if there is a speed trap that was set up and they were only ticketing people that were going like a hundred and like a 65 mm -hmm. or something it's like okay well are you, are you really going to complain at that point um so yeah I, I feel like the idea of having like a body that exists just to search for um people that are violating certain regulations i don't think there's anything inherently wrong with that and then setting up sting operations just to test people to make sure like are you guys following the you know restrictions like seems like it wouldn't necessarily be bad either you know when you bring up this sting operation in the bar where you know it's a girl and she's got two guys like hey i want to buy alcohol for these two guys 
guys and the guy's like okay yeah sure i'll sell it to you like that could have just as easily been like a normal 20 year old and she's got like two 21 year old friends in the back she's like hey can i buy drinks for those guys like it's not for me it's for them and then she goes back and they drink and then they all start drinking and you know in a bar you're probably not watching every single customer all the time like i, I don't know it feels that feels like a fair feels like a fair catch to me i don't know if you can complain about that Maybe, maybe, maybe that one is fair. I don't mm -hmm. think it was, but I think you could argue that that might be, you, know, I, you could argue that it's fair. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. You could argue, you could argue that it's fair, but whether it's fair or not, the incentive is for them to be predatory against small businesses. That's the issue that I have, right? Are you saying, well, Larry, uh, don't you want to, you know, enforce? I do. So then how about instead you judge the people you you judge the liquor authority by how safe a given area is. You know, how much drunk driving do you have? Or how many people are complaining? Or how many times do you find a youngster getting arrested for intoxication? Or something like that. That would be the right incentive, not cash. Once we turn in any way, shape, or form law enforcement into a profit center, it will by default become predatory. Well, I mean, like, That's what is my biggest issue? I mean, what's the alternative, though? Like at slavery? Like, do we like make so? Okay, like now you have to come and work for the state for two years, or is it like penance? Like no, you've got to go say not at all. Well, like how how else do we structure fines? Like, I mean, what? Like, it seems like a fine could, has to be like a dollar amount that you, you pay. You could keep the fines. I'm talking incentivized. I'll give you an example when it comes to the police force. Uh -huh. Right? Most police forces are given accolades. My father was in law enforcement, and many friends who were. Most of them given accolades by you know, a number of arrests. How often are people arrested, mm -hmm. right? Oh, good arrest, good collars, arrest, things of that sort. Or ticketing, if that's the case, right? They're judged by that. There are, it's very rare that you actually have quotas. That's very rare in police forces. Mm -hmm. But in reality, they have unwritten rules, right? So if I, if, if, if you're, you're a cop, Destiny, and, and, and you made 12 busts this month, and I only made eight, they don't say, Larry, your quota is 10. They go, look, Destiny did 12. Larry, what are you doing? What are you doing, Larry? What's going on? Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden now, I, I better go make some arrests now. That's a common problem you find. But what if you were instead, the cops were incentivized by people being and feeling safe in the neighborhoods, right? So if the people feel safe or are happy, you're a good cop. Not did you arrest enough of them or bust enough of them or decide that you wanted you know, to, to collect enough money through civil asset forfeiture. Civil asset forfeiture is the epitome of this, and that's what it really is, right? That's that's the paragon, maybe is a better word. It's the, it's the paragon of, of this. It is exactly what people have searched for. How can I go out there and hunt and get money? And when sure, you so do that, go ahead. I, I So civil asset forgery, for sure, I think everybody agrees that that's horrible. <laughs> Not um, at all. E even there's lots of people who love it, and they jump on it all day long. I see it all the time. There, no. there might be some people that love it, but I heard people like John Oliver had a huge segment on, on his show. I'm pretty sure Trevor Noah on The Daily Show has talked about it. Like civil asset forfeiture seems like one of those things that I, I feel like I hear people even in the mainstream um, will come out and talk about how, how dumb it is. Um, I, Why don't we stop it? What? Why don't we stop it? Um, my, If I had to guess... I would say that civil asset forfeiture policies are probably dictated by local police enforcement. And if I had to guess, most of these issues are going to come down to local elections. And the types of people that vote in local elections don't really care about civil asset forfeiture because their assets yep. aren't being forfeited civilly. Yes, this goes back to my first piece of us having no control that I talked well, about about an hour ago. We have it's a great deal of perfect example well, of that. We have a lot of control. We just don't exercise it because people don't vote, unfortunately. That's, but it's the same thing. That's what happens. That's how it works. Right, the people who are affected by civil asset forfeiture are people in poor neighborhoods mm -hmm. who don't have access to lawyers, who don't have act, who don't, who often are, are immigrants, who often are afraid of cops because they've been arrested more than once, they have a criminal record, so they go there and they hunt in brown and, and black and poor neighborhoods. That's what we happens all the time. So yeah, everyone's as you, to your point, everyone says civil asset forfeiture is bad, but they don't do anything. Nothing, nothing changes. That's that's my point. That should, civil asset forfeiture is without question unconstitutional, but doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. There's there's no way someone go. Oh yeah, totally constitutional. It's just take people's stuff when they're not accused of a crime, when they're not charged with a crime, when they're not convicted. There's no way that's constitutional. But it. But we do it. But we do it, and we doesn't change. And mandatory minimums, clearly not constitutional. Clearly not. And we do it. We keep doing it. 
So I don't think we have control of these things at all. We have to change incentivize. We have to re- change how we incentivize everybody. Incentivizing I mean, is everything. It isn't always money. Yeah, I, I, mean, I, I it don't. Sounds like money, but it isn't always money. There are a lot of issues, especially on local levels, that don't get the attention for for a variety of reasons. The, the right types of people don't vote to ever change these things. I agree with that. Um, I, I guess. Um, I guess, like I kind of have said before, like I agree that these things are problems. I just these solutions don't feel like they would fix any of these problems. So, for instance, when we talk about like incentivize. Um, we need to incentivize these things differently. Enforcement bodies should be incentivized to find people that are that need to be enforced on. That's the reason why they exist, right? Like if the FBI exists. Like, I want the FBI to be incentivized to finding people that are committing federal crimes. Um, or if local police departments exist, I want them to be incentivized to find people that are breaking, like, local laws and ordinances. Like, that's what they should be doing. Like, we need to incentivize them and empower them to do that. Now, I, and, and I feel like sometimes we're getting our wires crossed on this, or, or maybe that's just the impression I'm getting. I don't think that there's a problem incentivizing law enforcement to find people that are, are breaking laws. I think the problem sometimes is that we just don't agree with some of the laws that exist. Like, even civil asset forfeiture isn't necessarily a bad idea in concept, um, because I think that the concept of civil asset forfeiture is just that if there is a particular civil asset that's being used in the forfeiture of a crime, that the state has an authority to um, seize that asset. So for instance, let's say that you break into somebody's house and the house is being used as a meth lab, right? That maybe the state has some authority over, you know, taking it, it, part of the property or th- stuff going on in there. Um, or if you've got like a car that's like specially decked out to like run drugs or whatever, like maybe there are arguments there. But when these when these like there's no arguments there sure right, there's no arguments there for what if a person is not at at a minimum mm-hmm. arrested at a minimum indicted maybe but we take it when they're not even accused not arrested not indicted if you at least went to if they're indicted mm-hmm. maybe i could see right i there now we can have a conversation but civil asset forward to the person doesn't even have to be indicted at a minimum indicted at a minimum Sure. That, yeah, I, I so let me so here's here's like the analogy that I'll draw that is hard. Um I probably am already gonna know what your answer is, but like how do you feel for instance about like no fly lists? Whole idea for many reasons. Mm-hmm. Number one, there's no due process. Mm-hmm. Number two, the incentive is the same as I talked about before. What's the incentive for me? I'm a bureaucrat mm-hmm. and I create a no fly list. And what's my incentive? To put everybody possible on that list. Because if one person gets through and does something bad, I'm fired. So when I'm not sure, you're going to list. And not just that, here's what actually happens. Once you're on the list and you then say, hey, Mr. Bureaucrat Larry Sharp, um, I shouldn't be on the list. They go, I'm not talking to you, you're on the list. I'm not joking, that literally happens. So you can't, there's no due process to get off the list. And you get on the list based upon suspicion. You are being punished based upon suspicion not based upon a conviction. I would buy a conviction, at a minimum an indictment. But a conviction? Okay, you're indicted? Fine. But So that's the more. But number two on a no-fly list. Why in the world, how, how does a no-fly list actually work? Do, does all of a sudden now, you know, terrorists are no longer terrorists? Of course they are. They just find other ways of getting around. What winds up happening with all these laws is that the good people get punished and the bad people find other ways of doing stuff. That's what happens, right? We have all these know your customer laws for banks because we're afraid that all of a sudden, you know, the terrorists are gonna use banks. Mm -hmm. Well, first off, the big banks launder money. UBS did it more than once. Like you can check into Google search. UBS was convicted more than once of money laundering for drug cartels. So they do it anyway. So those laws are useless. But not just that this little guy doesn't use that bank anymore. He finds other ways of, of moving his money, and he does that. So who actually gets punished by a KYC law? You and I trying to open up a bank account, you know, to start a new business. We get punished, and we get harassed, and we get hassled, and we're not the bad guy. The no-fly list. Who's going to do 9-11 now? Nobody. We're worried about 9-11? Stop. That's not going to happen. Any guy gets up on a plane and goes, I'm taking a plane, and I'm going to whatever that guy is getting beaten to death on that flight within the next five minutes and there's gonna be no 9-11 in my lifetime again so we've got a no-fly list for no reason all it does is punish people for no reason at all bad guys just take the bus or something it's silly do we like is this kind of like a could we generalize this argument as an argument against kind of like all forms of like regulations or laws and do you believe that like no not laws? at all no okay because no no, no, I am all about incentivizing. How do we, how do I, and I'll go back to the idea you talked about. You said mm-hmm. cops should be going out and finding bad people. 
I disagree completely. Cops should be judged by how safe their neighborhood is. Period. Yeah, but how does a cop make a neighborhood safe? What do they do? Is what? it by finding bad people? Like, what is it? Like, it a cop isn't be. like building a school or a cop isn't like. No, it could be by police presence. It could be by police presence. What if you found nobody doing something bad in a specific area, but you simply had a lot of cops doing community policing? To where cop to where bad guys felt this isn't a safe place to do stuff because the cops are very close to the community. The community is going to tell on me. I can't find a safe house. I'm going to go someplace else and do my crimes. That would be a safe community, a well done police force. We're happy as can be. But once you t say no, they have to find people. They start kicking in doors. They start doing no knock warrants. That's what happens when you incentivize them to go find bad people. I want you to make the community safe. Do what you think and the community agree is appropriate to make the community safe. But I feel if like that means going after bad people, they will. If not, they might not have to. I, I, yeah, I mean, I guess it, it just it feels like it's all kind of the same things. So when we talk about like community policing, I mean, having police sure. present in certain areas are generally looking for people that are doing bad things, right? They or, are. Or we talk about like looking keep... for is different, right? If 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 you if I'm incentivized by, for example, something as simple as whatever's the local community equivalent of Yelp, I don't know what that would be, but mm -hmm. right, maybe the police creates the police force creates that thing, right? They create the type of thing that is the that is the uh, police for the the equivalent of a Yelp, whatever they do, mm -hmm. they create that. And every quarter or every year or every month or whatever it is, the people are happy and satisfied. Mm -hmm. I don't care if you arrest one guy or four hundred. If the people are happy, I'm pretty happy. And that's what I want. But if I'm judged by how many people I arrest, they're going to arrest people. What, you, what, what winds up happening is they start making more laws so they can make arrest more people. As the local community starts to abide by whatever local regulations there are, then what happens, local people go, we're not arresting anybody. Then they start backing more laws. I, know, I don't. I feel like I understand the incentive you're trying to draw, but I feel like that in the real world, I feel like it doesn't happen. That like you're if you, that if you're you right. if you have an area that's being like enforced and it's relatively peaceful, they just start crafting more laws so that they can start arresting people. I feel like this isn't something that realistically we would have to worry about, no. No. What winds up happening is they start arresting people in whatever the poor neighborhood of the area is, so they can say they're cracking they're cracking down on the local bad guy, and they and they turn the the local worst part of the neighborhood into a horrible place because there's no other place where they can find crimes. So if I've got a county that is in general rule a pretty good county, mm -hmm. but I have one poor neighborhood, I just shove all my cops into the poor neighborhood. And then that's how I wreck my numbers up and the people who are in a good neighbor go, see, cops are stopping these bad guys. When the, the drug use is almost always drugs, the drug use is probably pretty much the same throughout the entire county. How is this any different like than just having like a lot of like community policing though? Wouldn't it more or less look the same? You just have a bunch of police. I would and... like that too, if you want to. I'm okay with that. I'm All I'm saying is if a community is happy, then a community is happy. I don't care whether there's one arrest or 400 arrests. That's what I'm trying to get at. And I don't want to incentivize them by arrests or by action. Well, the worst part is after the 94 crime bill, if I'm not mistaken, they were about, I think first 50,000 and then 100,000. And 100,000 cops went into poor neighborhoods mm -hmm. and the federal government only paid for it for two years. After that, local communities had to find a way to pay for those cops. Boom, civil asset forfeiture. You just made law enforcement predatory. That's something that should have never happened. The war on drugs, as you know, I'm sure, should have ended decades ago. It should never began. But once it started, we should have ended it decades ago. It, we should have taken cannabis off of schedule one as early as Bill Clinton. That's what we should have done. Sure. But we didn't. We, he should have pulled it off. If he didn't, then Bush should have pulled it off. Obama should have pulled it off. Trump should have pulled it off. Biden should pull it off. And none of them do. This is literally a racket. The, the, the war on drugs is a massive money grab and money making scheme. That's why we don't end it. There are too many people making their career on this. And it's embarrassing. We've made law enforcement a profit center. That has to end. And this is my point. If you incentivize people to do other things, they will do other things. But we've made it to where it's lucrative to 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 train cops to kick in people's doors, and they shouldn't be. Yeah, I mean, I I, I guess in some ways I agree. I think that marijuana, the, the whole DEA scheduling thing seems pretty suspect. Um, Absolutely. And the everything related to the war on drugs has been an absolute unmitigated failure. Um, Absolutely. Obviously true. 
Um, <clears throat> the war on drugs has made more drugs. The war on terror has made more terrorism. Mm -hmm. It hasn't fixed war, anything. Wars this on anything. Easy. War on poverty doesn't seem to go. Yeah, the whole idea of That's having correct. a war on X is a pretty stupid way to phrase things. Um, or even a, a dumb idea to have. I don't, I don't disagree with that. Um, I guess I just, I guess like the one thing I'm just having trouble getting my head wrapped around is just the idea of like, it, it feels like when we talk about like creating incentives for law enforcement, we'd basically mm -hmm. be doing the same thing just in a little bit of a different way. So like, for instance, like earlier you'd suggest like we should do like community policing instead of having whatever we have now. It's like, well, what if we do community policing and all of the community policing just still happens in the poor neighborhoods with a lot of crime? Like you'd more or less see the same things happening, right? Like law enforcement Maybe. is always going to be incentivized to find criminals and find people breaking the law. That's what you keep saying, but I'm going to give you an example, all right, sure. if I could. Mm -hmm. um, you personally, mm -hmm. are are you incentivized by the number of podcasts, live podcasts that you do, or are you incentivized at the end of the month, did the right amount of money that you expected, or hopefully more than you expected, did it come in? That's how you're, you're not incentivized by the number of live streams that you do. It is irrelevant whether mm -hmm. you do one a month or if you do 60 a month, that's sure. irrelevant. The point is that the right amount of money that you expected, I hope more than that, mm -hmm. comes in every month. If it doesn't, you have to make changes. And you might decide that means more live streams, or you might decide that means longer live streams, or left live, or whatever the case may be. But if I incentivize you by the number of live streams that you do is how you get paid, you will do a whole bunch of live streams because that's how you're incentivized. And I'm equivalenting that to number of arrests versus safer community at the end of a quarter year a month if sure, you were incentivize cops that way they will do what's required mm -hmm. to make it a safer environment wouldn't a solution to this just literally be like any money that a cop raises by doing an arrest or whatever uh fine or ticket all of that money just goes to like the city's general fund uh not general fund um what i actually said my my plan was mm -hmm. you take a certain amount but you cap it, whatever that number is. In a given, say, jurisdiction, say it's $100,000 a year. I'm making the number up, right? Mm -hmm. Let's take an argument. Everything after $100,000 a year gets returned in a tax rebate to everybody there, mm -hmm. everybody in that area. Sure. Uh, you go to a general fund, it's you're raising money. It's a profit center. It can't go to a general fund. Well, but at least not, like the police officers the themselves mayor. wouldn't be like... Then the mayor's yelling at cops to, to arrest more people because he needs to fill his coffers because he has a budget deficit. No, thank you. I'll pass on that. I see that stuff all the time. Yeah, no, but again, I feel you. like you run into, you have the exact same problem. It's just you push it down the line. So if we're saying that we're going to give a tax rebate, then you can still have a mayor hypothetically saying like, okay, I've got an election coming up. It's going to be a close one. We need a really big rebate. You guys need to really be hamming up those tickets. Like it feels like you that still have a, the same problem. You might have a bit of a problem that you might. It's possible, right? But again, I would rather try that than just put in the general fund. Because at a minimum, if it's just, if it's just the rebate, to keep the mayor or the city official happy, at least people around him would attack him for it. There'd be some defense. But if it's going to general fund, all the bureaucrats win. So they're all going to be like, yeah, put it in the general fund. But if it's not in the general fund, at least if the mayor is doing this, there'll be people who are his political enemies who will at least bring it to your attention. It's not perfect. I am not saying it's a perfect system. Mm -hmm. I'm saying at least it gives us some control over it. Right now, we have be most of Americans right now are being run by inertia. We have almost no control about what most of us are doing in, the, in this one. Most Americans have given up. There's a learned helplessness you see everywhere. That's why we're fighting culture wars all the time and not trying to f solve any problem. Sure. I mean, that's where we are now. We're not solving problems. We're fighting culture wars. Yeah, I, I agree one billion percent with that. That and yeah. Yes. And it's. I think it's really sad that. Um, there are so many issues right now that exist that somehow get wrapped into being part of the culture wars when it should be like a relatively non-controversial um, thing. You know, like when we talk about like, you know, should we be cutting taxes for a huge corporations? Somehow this becomes a partisan issue where you've got a bunch of people making less than 30000 a year championing huge businesses, um, you know, getting tax breaks. And it's like, why? Um, and it's because, well, this is uh -huh. my team. Yeah, I agree with that one million percent. I think it's yes. really stupid. Yeah. So a lot of people, sometimes I hear people very often, they get mad at my ideas. Larry, that can't work or this can't work. Or, Maybe it won't, but I'm talking about solving stuff. So help me to, to fix this thing. I'll, I'll bring up this, this corporate thing you just brought up now, right? Most people I know would mm -hmm. like corporations to pay more. Most would, mm -hmm. right? But when we try to tax them, it fails constantly. They find ways around it. They fix things. They change things. Mm -hmm. They find ways around this. So an idea that I brought up, which drives people crazy, okay. but I still think it's awesome. And that is leasing naming rights to bridges in New York City. 
Mm-hmm. So you want uh, so Coca Cola, Pepsi, whatever Kellogg's wants to name a bridge in New York City. It's a bridge that's in that is literally in a 16 million person metro area. It gets mentioned hundreds of times every single day uh, during the traffic reports. When people are doing movies and TV shows, you'll see it in the shops when they're doing all types of media. Give us $100 million a year. You can have the lease, the naming rights to the bridge. You're responsible for maintenance. Of course, you still are. We still own the infrastructure and we still inspect it. And we get that cash and that helps to get rid of the tolls on the bridge that actually affect the actual individual who's paying in New York City $18 to cross one bridge. Mm -hmm. And now we can actually repair the bridge without tolls and without extra taxes. That kind of thing still gets the, 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 the corporations to pay more money. They're dropping three to four billion, five billion dollars every year in marketing. Hundred million dollars a year is nothing. How do I know that they would actually do it? Because when I was running for governor, I had bankers coming to me asking me about how long it would be, what would be the deal, all those types of things. People were already talking about the concept. They loved the idea. They were open to financing it, the whole deal. Now, that gets the the corporations to pay for infrastructure. It just allows them to do it with a carrot and not a stick. Does it feel... Go ahead. Does it feel a little, uh, this might just be like a personal feeling, I guess. Does it feel a little dystopian? Like the yes. idea that like I'm I'm walking over the KFC bridge and then I'm yes. heading down into Coca-Cola parks so that I can sit on yep. like a Amazon trademark bench? Like, Yes, it does. But the option, the, the, uh, the alternative is what we have now, which is my state has a $50 billion deficit, $400 billion in debt, Mm-hmm. Broken infrastructure, bridges that collapse, poor people who have to pay $18 to cross a bridge. That's what we have now. Mm-hmm. And no one has any other answer other than raise more taxes. 55 cent tax on gas. People are leaving my state left and right. As you know, I lost uh, one person or I lost a representative uh, in the census already. Um, nothing but bad. My state's falling apart. So is it a, is it a bit negative? Yeah, it is. Mm-hmm. But what's your alternative? Right now, the alternative is, is things like congestion pricing which keeps, again, the middle class out of the city and the wealthy already live there. So again, that helps the wealthy and doesn't raise any money. What is it, these con- are failures. What is congestion pricing? I've never... Mm. That's that's if you go into the city, you pay an extra fee to go into certain parts of the city. Interesting, gotcha. Where the wealthy already went, live. So okay. they don't pay it, only poor people who want to come and pay it. Gotcha. So is, is it dystopian? Yes. If you have a better answer, my ears are open. But this would actually get the, the the companies to voluntarily pay for infrastructure. I'll go to the pothole thing. Mm-hmm. Pizza Hut fixes potholes, right? Because it messes with their cars and their drivers. So they actually, that's the thing. They, they fix a pothole and they put the, uh, the Pizza Hut symbol on the pothole. Mm-hmm. Well, that's really bad. So what I would do is instead allow Pizza Hut to take a couple of streets and to fix potholes in the streets. And I give them a billboard in the street. This, this potholes repaired by Pizza Hut. But Larry, they won't go to poor neighborhoods. They might not. I don't know. I think poor people like pizza as much as rich people. But maybe maybe it's true. Maybe they won't go to poor neighborhoods. So what? I'm not firing all of the people who fix potholes. They can still fix the potholes. But guess where they fix the potholes? In the poor neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. So the poor people get better service. The potholes get filled. The corporations pay to fix the potholes. Everybody's happy. Is it dystopian? Maybe. But what's our answer now? Shitty roads all over my state with potholes that break everything. Mm-hmm. and a deficit that we can't fix and people running out of my state. Mm-hmm. If you got a better answer, I'm open. But here's the best part. If I'm bringing up these answers and they're wrong, then you can help me make them right. All I want is the end game where I have poorer people in my state not not being stuck because they can't afford to leave mm-hmm. and wealthy people paying what they should pay to help out people voluntarily because it makes sense for them. This is what I mean by incentivizing. I'm incentivizing the companies to fix the roads, and they would do it. They're already doing it. Mm-hmm. I would incentivize the bankers to finance it. They are already they want to do it. They're already doing it. That's what I want to do. Take some of that money they're sending over to uh, the Cayman Islands and put it into fixing my bridges. A better idea. That's just my view. I, so in some ways, um, some of what you're talking about can be seen 
uh, I think from my personal experiences in the real world. So I've made the drive several times from um, Nebraska down to Miami, Florida. And you know, as soon as you hop on like the Florida Turnpike, you know you're on a toll road because those roads are like perfect. In my experience, yep. at least when I, if I, if I'm driving on a toll road, I know because it's very smooth, it's very nice. And as soon as you hop off, you're on like the fucking moon or Mars or whatever with the craters and everything being. And then the city that I'm from in Nebraska, Omaha has huge pothole problems as well. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the, we have huge problems with infrastructure in the United States. Um, I, I can't, uh, I can't defend the current system to you, obviously. Um, yep. I would look stupid doing it, and we both know that it is not working in the United States for whatever reason. I guess um, the the only difference between you and me is that I'm pushing more on the end of like public funding to fix a lot of this, which for I don't know, I don't know why. I don't know why the United States seems so unwilling or incapable of allocating the money that it needs to repair its infrastructure. Um, I don't know why so many European countries seem to do it so much better than us. It's very frustrating to me. It's very embarrassing to me to travel overseas and mm-hmm. um, I'll be in some itty bitty no name German city Krefeld and they have like public buses that run around the clock and I, and I can go anywhere and and the only place in the US that has any type of public transit is like New York or maybe a couple yep. of cities um yeah I, I so I'm kind of curious I guess um so um so I guess well so actually just a couple thoughts so <clears throat> Typically, um, I think sense to you. Am I coming from a place where you can understand where I'm coming from at least? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So usually when people introduce themselves as libertarian, um, usually you have like this philosophical commitment to minimizing the role of government in any conceivable or possible way. Um, it feels like, I guess, in terms of like you being a libertarian, um, it's more just you've identified a set of problems that most people in America should acknowledge these problems exist and then you're trying to think of like well you know we haven't tried this let's try this um what we're doing right now doesn't work so you know maybe we can do this and maybe that'll work and you know maybe this is a bad idea and maybe it's not going to fix it 100 but right now what we're doing isn't working and but this every might work. idea mm-hmm. i've come up with mm-hmm. is no force and no extra taxes sure that's the libertarian mm-hmm. view mm-hmm. no force and no extra taxes those are the two things. And the goal is to remember, mm-hmm. government's a monopoly. So it's a general rule I'm trying to create another option for people that is a community-based to the best of my ability, locally-based if I can do it, mm-hmm. at a minimum private-based, maybe a non-profit-based, but something else. All my policies, and I, if anybody who cares, you can go to LarrySharp.com. Mm-hmm. My policies are still there. LarrySharp.com slash policy. Check them all out. And as I said, I have that my answers for all. I went down, it's actually about six hours total. I went down Bernie Sanders' website in four different videos and I gave up a, a libertarian answer for every single piece, every single thing of, of any one of his policies, because I believe that this is the only way. And I'll give you one minor other thing that I believe is important. Mm-hmm. Because of us specifically in America, the only way we heal our country is through the libertarian movement. The only way. And the reason why I say that is Democrats won't vote for Republicans, Republicans won't vote for Democrats, left and right's getting por- torn apart. The only third party that has any power, and the Libertarian Party has hardly any power, but the only one that has any power is the Libertarian Party. We are the only party that gets 50 state ballot access every single year. We're the only party that actually has some infrastructure in almost every state. We are the only party that has any chance. I mean, it's, you know, Democrats, Republicans, and then way down to below Libertarians, but there's no one else even close to us. We are the third party. If we actually, imagine if we only had two or three libertarians right now in the Senate, just two, Mm -hmm. we'd be the swing vote. Guys like me talking the way I talk would be the swing vote. Most of the libertarians that people hear are edgelords on the internet. Mm -hmm. They haven't actually run for office like I have. Sure. They haven't, they haven't actually run a full campaign like I have. They haven't been in debates like I have with actual politicians. They haven't talked to actual mayors and governors and people like that who have real, who understand real policy. Most haven't done that. I have. Mm-hmm. That's why I talk the way I talk. I'm speaking about how to fix actual problems in a way that has no extra taxes. And and we had one libertarian congressman last year, mm-hmm. Justin Amash. There were there were no others, and now he's out. So there are no libertarian people in in, in the uh, in Congress. How do when you... George Floyd died, when mm-hmm. he died, when he was killed, the left said defund the police. The right yelled back the blue, and nothing changed. Mm-hmm. He is the first person to create a tripartisan bill. He said, Justin Amash said, you know what? Let's start with ending qualified immunity. And he realized that he couldn't do it on his own. He's the only libertarian that there is. So he literally went to the left and the right. He got Democrats, Republicans to sign it. And of course, Nancy Pelosi, Democrat. And at that point, it was Mitch McConnell, Republican. Neither of them would, of course, 
have any chance of voting for it. So, of course, it died. But he actually did something to fix something back in the summer. And now New York City recently actually ended qualified immunity. But we were on the ball immediately for that. We were trying to fix things immediately. And we went across the aisle. If you're a Democrat now and you cross the aisle, you get primaried out. You, you lose your job. You're Republican now. You go across the aisle. You get primaried out. You lose your job. Only libertarians can cross both sides only. We're the only ones who can. How do you feel about um, Biden's like big plan for infrastructure? Are you generally against stuff like that? or? Um, Generally, I'm against it generally, but that's not a 100 percent rule. Mm -hmm. I think we do need if you're going to do a bailout package. And this is why I'm be very clear on, on what I mean by this. I said off the bat, if you're going to do a bailout package, it should come to us as individuals. Well, we don't do that. Wait, what do you mean? Can you explain that? What do you mean by that? Sure. For example, if you decide and I don't know how they decide this, you're going to have two trillion dollars to give away. Mm hmm. Why are we deciding that a bunch of it goes towards police forces, a bunch of it goes towards state and local governments, a bunch of it goes towards specific places that I have cronies and friends at? Why not just say, I don't know how many households there are in America. For the sake of argument, there are 100 million. I don't know if there are. Say there's 100 million households in America. Divide that 100 million, divide 2 trillion by 100 million, write them a check or write them a check over time or whatever. Just have well, us spend it. I think that the that, um... that's a stimulus package. If you want to, if you want to do a stimulus, give us the money and we'll stimulate and we'll stimulate the economy if well, you want to. I think the goal was um I, I think the goal wasn't to just stimulate the economy. I'm talking specifically about the two trillion dollar infrastructure package that had like like six hundred billion was supposed to go specifically to like public transport, rail, um, like roads and bridges and stuff, and then like a hundred billion is supposed to go towards the highway. And, and I can go look up like, but like yes. it was no, no, uh, I know yeah. what you mean. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that was the first. Piece. The second piece that bothers me about this is I don't believe any of it. We haven't built anything worth a damn in this country as a government since I don't know when. Matthew the, the moonshot? Is that the last time we did it? Cents. I mean, at one point we Larry, used to build stuff we don't anymore. And the reason why we don't build anything anymore is governor. because whatever well, money that goes out, say it's $600 million that goes to X or Y or whatever it is, it's going to be late, expensive, and suck. Because it has. I can't. I'm trying to. Maybe you can tell me when I can't remember something we built that was impressive as a as a as a government that we've actually built since the moonshot. Did I miss something? I can't think of one. They're they're they don't work. They're they're bad. They're over budget. I mean, NASA does some cool stuff. I'll give them that. But that's about it. Everything else has been over budget, under delivered, over promised, failed miserably in my state, New York. My governor has gone out of his way to do at least 20 projects. Every single one of them has failed. Mm -hmm. Every one of them has failed. So great, you got $2 trillion. It's, you're gonna get maybe $100 million, $100 billion worth of anything of value. The rest goes into waste, fraud, and abuse. And not just that, it goes into bureaucrats whose job it is to make sure things stop. The problem is our government is filled with people whose job it is to say no. There's no one's job it is to say yes. So the reason why I'm against it, it fails. What would be a better way of doing it? If you want to bail people out or build something, incentivize it being built. That is a better way of doing it. There is a better way to do it. An example might be, I'm making this up for sake of argument. Now, that's my, incentiv my, my incentivizing. Mm -hmm. You say you want to build bridges and tunnels or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. So you create rules and regulations to build tunnels, whatever those things are. If company X does it, and it follows our rules and regulations, they get some type of benefit or bonus, like a Project X type. That is a better way of doing it. Will it be, will there still be fraud? Of course. Will there still be waste? Of course. But there'll be nowhere near as much. And now the people who can do it will go out and go do it. And they'll gain, and those companies will grow and become more powerful. But more importantly, you could even do it if you wanted to target it, right? If you wanted to target it and say, well, we want to make sure some of these companies are owned by minorities or owned by disabled vets or owned by in circle people here and they get the benefit if you're this thing you get the benefit that's a better way of incentivizing than something else because i don't trust the government to decide what should be built or how it should be built or when it should be built i think they will fail why because they've been failing for at least 60 years and probably longer do, isn't this, doesn't this just take the form, though, of basically ending up with the government is like contracting these jobs out? Like, don't we do that to a large extent anyway when it comes to things like no, construction? No, or... because there's no control. There's no control except 
if you build a bridge, here are regulations. Mm -hmm. But I'm not telling you which build bridge to build. I'm not telling you who to hire to build it. If it gets done, submit your paperwork, get your benefit, whatever the benefit is. If it doesn't get done, you don't get a benefit. If it's not done to our specifications, you don't get the benefit. So done. like if somebody just wanted to build like a bunch of random bridges in like San Francisco, like they could just like build bridges across. Like we don't, we don't want any kind of like regulatory oversight for like how many. I didn't say that at all. I said or, literally I have I have mm -hmm. my my guidelines on what you have to build, but not just that. Local people. If I'm a federal government and I'm saying I'm going to incentivize you, local uh, local municipalities will still have their own rules anyway, and so will states. Mm -hmm. I'm talking from the federal level, right? If I've got X trillion dollars, whatever I've got, I would rather incentivize that way, and then get people to grow in that way. The local municipalities will still have their own regulations and rules, and so will states. Why does the federal government have to be involved in this except to motivate people to act? Mm -hmm. It's a much better way of incentivizing. Again, not perfect, but better than what we have now. And I'd ask you, did, did I miss something? Did we do something great since the moonshot? Uh, no, I mean, I feel like the United States has a lot of pro problems spending publicly. Uh, yep. I, they, they, I guess the only pushback is returning to something I said earlier in this conversation. Like, it feels like I can travel across so many different cities in Europe that just do so much in terms of investing in like their public infrastructure and yep. you have these like amazing cities that have really cool buildings and they've got like all this awesome like mixed residential zoning um and they've got like amazing public transport and their roads aren't falling apart and they're all doing this through forms of like government funding like that's all yes. or government spending that's all funded by taxation or whatever um so it's it feels like <clears throat> It feels like that's like a better direction to head than to go the other way where, okay, well, let's just like ultra privatize a lot of things and see if we can incentivize like private companies to take care oh, of it. We, we've yeah. been following their example. We've just been failing at it. Yeah, but when it seems I like, well, it's because we're never York. willing to go like that far. It seems like there's always like a ton of I political pushback. I disagree completely. Have you seen how Boston works? Have you seen how New York City works? All of New York State is run by Economic Development Corporation, which is run directly by the state. We have state funding in everything. We control everything in New York State. Nothing gets built unless a regional economic development corporation says it can be built. Mm -hmm. We control everything. Our Department of Buildings in New York City controls everything. We do. The problem is our culture isn't their culture. We have failed so much, we need a different answer. We've been throwing money at these problems for decades. We have all the same things. We have the same... I, I did, an, uh, I did a, a thing about the, the MTA. The MTA in New York City, the largest metro um, subway system in our country, to build anything in the MTA is at least four times more expensive than any other major nation on the planet to include countries like France and Germany and England who have unions, who have regulatory bodies, who have all those things and large cities. Our system is garbage. It's full of nothing but garbage. I don't want it. That system's done. I would much rather change how that's done. Why I do talked about... Go ahead. Why do we think, why do so many European states succeed at this when the U.S. seems to fail at it? Why, what is the, what's the difference there? Or why, yeah, that's, I guess that's the thing that bothers me the most. I'm actually unsure what the actual, what the reasons are. I'm sure it's multiple reasons. Mm -hmm. But if I had to guess, I would say one of them is that we're a very litigious society, far more than they are. Mm -hmm. And most people are afraid of failure because a mistake or failure wraps them up in court like there's no tomorrow, mm -hmm. costs them so much money and devastates them, gets people fired. We have a zero tolerance culture, right? You make one mistake, you're fired. You do one thing wrong, you're done. All these things are bad and everybody gets sued for every single thing. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that's the biggest piece, but I'm sure that's a part of it. It's one of the reasons why um, that, that we, we don't get things done. Everybody, our entire system is set up for example, I'll give you an example. Again, I go in New York, in New York State. The um, the uh, environmental department here in New York State, its goal is to just protect the environment. That's a terrible goal. The goal should be to ensure that New York State can build and grow while protecting the environment. You might say, does that really matter? It does tremendously, because that means the organization is set up to say no, not to show how it can be done safely. That's not their job. Their job is to say no if it isn't perfect. And that's most of our government agencies now across the country, to all of them in New York State, in New York City that way, but most of them across the country, they are set up to only say no if it's not perfect and not to say, no, this is bad. Let me show you how 
you can build this correctly. Let me assist you and be your partner in getting this built. We don't do that. If we instead had a system to where, you know, again, I'll go and incentivize. Mm -hmm. How is a bureaucrat incentivized? And I believe, who was it? Was it, no, I think it might've been Fareed Zakaria who just did a show uh, on this, on a CNN show. He was talking about how everyone is incentivized to say no, because if I let you build this thing and something goes wrong, I'm in trouble, I'm fired. So I'm gonna stop you at every point. But the reverse isn't true. If I help 25 people build something safely in their community or area, that's just my job. Well, good done, there's your paycheck. But I should be incentivized by what gets built safely, right? Did this thing get built? It did. Did people get hurt? No, well done. You are now incentivized for that. Well done, you get promoted or you get a bonus or whatever is the appropriate thing in your job. Right, you get accolades or a little ribbon or whatever is the thing. I was in Marine Corps, we like ribbons. Mm -hmm. So whatever is the thing you get, right? You get that thing because stuff was built safely, not something went wrong and now you're punished. The incentivization of our government and our bureaucrats is exactly the wrong way of incentivizing them and they act accordingly. Hmm, okay. Yeah, I mean, I I, guess at the end of the day, I mean, I think the best thing you said is probably that like some of these things need to start on local levels so that we can see how they work. Yes, um, absolutely. Yeah, uh, one thing that is really damaging, I think, to the progress in this country is we have become hyper focused on federal level stuff, and local yep. level stuff is just seen as like not cool and nobody cares. Um, but it seems like most of the successful, like a lot, of, I like the idea. For instance, like a lot of people think we need single payer or multi payer. Well, California has like I think um, Medi-Cal, I think is what it's called. Mm-hmm. And hey, you know, if it works really well here, maybe that expands to other states. Um, I, I think that starting things at local levels is better. It'd be interesting to see like this hardcore kind of private incentivization that you're talking about. I guess start at some local yep. area, and then we can kind of see how it goes. I guess, unfortunately, the only big examples that I can think of have run into huge problems. So, like, I know in the United Kingdom, they tried to privatize a lot of their rails, um, and the companies that competed for that ended up not producing the best results. I know that- But ten- hold on, I, w- I want to be clear on this. Yeah. You've used that phrase more than once, and I've never used it. Oh, I've sorry. never talked about privatizing. Um, I'm not talking about privatizing. Wait, I'm sorry, still- when you say, I'm sorry, in terms of private, I mean, you're talking about setting up different chains of incentivization, I guess, right? Correct. So they yes. could, so theoretically, could all still be government related. It would just be Absolutely. incentivized different. Oh, okay. Yes, incentivized differently, and no matter what, the government still owns the asset. The mm-hmm. government doesn't give the asset away. It still owns it and still inspects it. Well, like if with the government. So, like, let's say that like a private company like built a bridge and designed it to all their specs and everything, and then named it. The government would still own the bridge, or correct? Absolutely, but there'd be some reason, some incentive for them to do so. For example, I'm making this up again for sake of argument. Uh-huh. Depends on where this is in the country, where it makes sense. In a large city like New York City, you build the bridge, you get to name it for 20 years. That's now your bridge for 20 years. Right? Done. That kind of thing, again, people would say, well, Larry, it's going to cost a billion dollars to build the bridge. Not that much because they'll, they'll make it for less. But it's our inspection. It will follow our rules. It doesn't count. If, it, if they don't do this, it doesn't count. It's got to be to our rules, our specifications. If they do it and it works, mm-hmm. then great. They get the benefit, whatever the benefit would be. Obviously, in smaller areas, naming a bridge isn't going gonna, isn't gonna to be the right answer. But there may be other, maybe it's a, you know, they make 10 bridges. They get all 10 of them or Whatever the case may be, I don't know if naming rights is the answer for everything. I just know in New York City it is. That I'm sure. I don't know if it would work in other areas. But you get the benefit if you do the thing. That's a much better way of doing it. Gotcha. We still own it. We still own it. We still inspect it. Right now in New York State, bridges still collapse. Right now, they, they collapse. Mm-hmm. I would argue that if we had more corporate sponsorship of, of bridges, less would collapse. And my example is we already have corporate sponsorship for cleaning and, and taking care of the litter on roads. Already we have that in New York in New York State. And the roads that have that are cleaner. Mm-hmm. So, Yeah, it kind of reminds still, me of the, uh, I think for, we've got like the adopter interstate program or whatever. Stuff absolutely. Like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes, and those interstates are cleaner. It has worked. So if we have this, I, that's the example I use, right? Mm-hmm. Naming rights. People drop 20 million, companies, not companies, people, mm-hmm. people. Um, companies drop $20 million dollars a year for a stadium mm-hmm. that's used on the weekends. I'm talking about a bridge that's used every day. That's on Google Maps now as they cross. Mm-hmm. That's worth some cash. It's worth some cash. It's a way that we can actually get the people to pay the cash that we want them to pay, and they'll want to. They'll happily do it. This is not a bad idea. Sure. Yeah. So, 
if I can jump in briefly, um, uh, just checking time. We normally run these for two hours. First, mm-hmm. happy running it long if you guys want to keep going. Second, would you guys mind taking about 15 minutes for uh, questions? There were some people asking if they could uh, ask both of you guys questions. I'm happy to take questions if you are. Yeah, questions are fun. All right. Do you guys want to keep going or you want to jump straight to questions? Um, we can go to questions. Unless yeah. you want, if you have something to say, Destiny, tell me, please. No, I mean, I think I think we understand each other. All right. Uh, so the first one we had, uh, first mentor was asking if he could ask a question. Anyone else, if you want to, uh, go ahead and DM me uh, directly, and we'll organize it from there. I love it. We'll start taking questions. I love it. Most of these things, uh, I when I ran my campaign, I ran it for about a year and a half in New York State. I did the entire thing live on Facebook mm-hmm. and never took notes and just took every question that came at me. That I'm happy sense. to do it. Happy to do it. And I got yelled at a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so that's fine. And I still get yelled at. So it's okay. I don't mind at all. Hey, guys. Right. Can you hear me okay? Mm-hmm. Hi. Uh, uh, my name's First Amender. Uh, I'm going to apologize in, inf- in advance before I ask a question because uh, I-, I just want to give you guys like a short monologue to bear with me. Uh, I hope you guys both might like this at the end of it. So like I wanted to say I'm like a really huge fan of both of you guys. And from what I've heard... It sounds like both of you are agreeing more than disagreeing. I was assuming much more disagreement, to be honest. And because Destiny is far more versed in online debates, I sort of felt bad for Larry Sharp, as I'm not sure he's as versed in online debates than Destiny is. Though with that being said, Destiny, huge fan. I watched like all of your videos. The recent one on Richard Wolf was hilariously good. And from here on out, tanky socialists forever have a stain on their repertoire among debate circles. And for that, you keep pushing extremism out of political circles on the right and the left. And as well as many uh, other contributions, I thank you for your effort. And uh, for Larry, I wanted to say that if I lived in New York, I would have voted for you and would have helped you in your election. Thank I you. run a freedom-based blog platform. It's not a big website, but I believed in your platform so much that I made an ad for my site so people reading articles would consider you and help you get elected. It was a shame that libertarians tend not to win elections, but True. regardless, you hold your standards of legality and morality, how things should be, and you are what I would call a moral politician. When someone says something wow. like, all politicians are evil, I can easily use the name Larry Sharp and show that these evil politicians, in fact, can be good. Oh, thank you, brother. I appreciate it. Okay, that. questions now. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for the monologue. No, you can call me cool all day long. <laughs> <laughs> Destiny. Uh, okay, so I tend not to argue against what you think on most subjects. They just simply make sense. With that being said, how is it that you call yourself a democratic socialist and not something like a centrist? It sounds to me that you believe in private markets. Why would you place the word socialist to describe your politics? Um, this is uh, depending on what circles you run in. This might sound like equivocation, but I very specifically I never call myself a democratic socialist. I call myself a social democrat. Um, I think I'm probably. Um, I, 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 based on everything that I know of the views of different people across the political spectrum, I think social democrats are pretty accurate. Um, I'm in favor of private markets, but I, I think that capitalism is incredibly useful, and I think that markets are very powerful and should be respected. Uh, but I am usually in favor of much higher levels of social spending, which I think is like about what a social democrat is. So I'd be compared to like um, like a Nordic or Scandinavian person, I guess, basically. Okay, that's fair. Mm-hmm. And for Larry, uh, so libertarians have an issue in winning elections. As a result, it might actually be best to register as a Republican and push libertarian policies to actually make differences. So what do you say about this idea? And if it's a bad idea, why? It's a terrible idea because Republicans aren't libertarians. Republicans pretend they're libertarians and they make us all look bad. But they're not actually libertarians. <laughs> I mean, yeah, they're right? not. They're I mean, they, maybe in yeah. the 80s they were more libertarian, but like now they're – yeah. But the, now they just make us look bad. So no, <laughs> because we're not Republicans. But not just that. Look at what's happened with – again, I'll go back to Justin Amash. He started the Freedom Caucus, and he left because it got co-opted by more mainstream Republicans. But not just that. The Republican Party is is going to always be like the Democrat Party in one way. They don't have any policies that aren't anti the other. Their policies aren't focused on actual success. Their policies are focused on I'm not the other. That's the issue. 
Libertarians are the only people who can actually make impact. That we can be the peacemakers. It's possible. If we people got mad at me because they didn't get behind Trump or get behind um, Biden during the election, what difference did it make? If we remember, Bush got us Obama. Obama got us Trump. Trump got us Biden. You like or hate one of them, probably if you're an American. So they rotate back and forth. Biden will try will give us probably Kamala. Kamala will lose to whatever the cool Republican is next time, and we'll go back to the Republicans again. Nothing changes. Yeah, the I don't only like way things change is <laughs> a both third happy. party and a mediator. We can be the mediator. That's why I, w- I want to say libertarian. Thanks, Larry. Thanks, Destiny. This is like an amazing time. Thank you. All right. Next question uh, is uh, my own um, for both of you guys, but um, I guess we'll start with Destiny. Uh, the recent uh, Biden administration proposal for the infrastructure bill, I believe it was tagged at nearly two billion dollars. Two trillion. Roughly. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Two trillion, not yeah. two billion. I wish roughly, you would explain. Roughly five percent of that goes to roads and bridges. Mm-hmm. Yep. How do you feel about that? Um, that, that infrastructure package looks unbelievably amazing to me. Uh, I'm a huge fan of it. If that actually passed, um, I think it would be uh, like unbelievable. There's so much money in that going to like much needed infrastructure projects across the United States. Um, for whatever reason, it seems like we have so much trouble passing these types of big things. I, I don't know why we send so much money to, um, like places overseas. We spent a lot of money mm-hmm. in Afghanistan. Um, I, I think, it, I think it would be awesome if it passes. I hope for the best, but yeah. Um, I think it is a terrible idea because it's not going to work at all. I don't trust government to do it right. I think they will fail miserably. If they were going to do something right, here's what I would have them do instead. One of two things, or both. One, end all of the embargoes and sanctions that we have against every country and every person and across the world. End them all. Allow us to start opening up uh, business in all of those different companies. End the the military industrial complex by first declaring victory in every hot war we have and begin to pull our troops back. Then, at the same time, begin slowly as our treaties begin to end, pulling back the empire. Pull the empire back so we stop spending so much money on all this garbage that we spend money on. And then, as that happens, opening up businesses so that we can take those people and bring business back in. Because the military industrial complex is a massive jobs program. That's why we don't get rid of it. It's not because there's anything of any value to it other than that. It's a massive jobs program. So find other ways of people to make money and to have jobs and careers while we bring the military industrial complex down. Second part that I would add, instead of this, if we're going to spend money, if we're going to actually spend that amount of money, debt relief is far more important for the average American. The average American can actually deal with the idea of not making as much money. That will suck, but an average American will tighten their belt and deal with it. What crushes them is what they owe, their debt. You, I would do some debt relief. And you might say, Larry, are you saying bail out the banks? I kind of am, and it sounds horrible. I know Libertarians are going to get mad at me when I say that. But I would rather have a real debt holiday. Something like say, hey, all banks, you, in, if you're in America, you may not force anyone to pay any debt for three months. I'm making that up for sake of argument, but something like that. And we're going to write you a check and make magic money from the Fed because we just always make magic money anyway. We'll make our magic Fed money and we'll write you a check. You'll have your actuaries tell us what the bill is. We'll give you X dollars, uh, X cents on a dollar. Basically, basically, the government will buy the debt is basically what I'm saying. The government will buy three months of debt from every every American. Something like that, that's way better for Americans. That's way better as a stimulus. Something like that. That's a much better plan. End the, end the military industrial complex, which is a jobs program, so that we can grow across the country and give debt relief to Americans. All right. So I'll try to carve out just another 10 minutes for questions before we close up here. Uh, next question we have is from Mosk Strauman uh, for Larry Sharp. Do you think that Rand Paul represents libertarianism to an acceptable degree for a Republican? For a Republican? Yes, but he's, he's not, but he's not libertarian. Right. Rand Paul is the one who wrote the uh, justice for um, Rihanna Taylor bill. Right. That's what Rand Paul did. So, yes, for a Republican. Yes. But he's not libertarian. He is a Republican. All right. Next question is from Bratito uh, for both of you guys. I guess we'll start with Destiny. Uh, do you believe in the Electoral College? Um, I think it's OK. So. 
I, um, especially now, because the left seems to be um, getting more and more people. Now, I, I think a lot of people on the left kind of want to just make everything done by popular vote everywhere because they think they have the numbers for it. But I, I, I mean, maybe this is a little bit old timey in how I think. I still like the idea of there being both representation of people and representation of states when it comes to making decisions on things. So like, so like here's two ends that I would approach this from. I think that the Electoral College is okay in that smaller states are disproportionately greater represented per person because I think there should be some type of state representative when it comes, or some type of state representation when it comes to choosing our head of state. However, um, that exists in the Senate as well. I would be in favor of lifting the cap on the number of representatives we have and dramatically rebalancing that, which would also change how the Electoral College works as well because the Electoral College, I believe, is your number of representatives plus... Um, it might just be that plus, plus two. Senators. Is it plus ten? Plus senators. Yeah. Plus ten. Oh yeah, yeah. Plus two. Yeah. Oh yeah. So plus senators. Yeah. So so the rebalancing of the uh, of the house would also rebalance the electoral college. Um, and then I would also be in favor of. I think that the electoral college. I think every state should split their vote like Nebraska and Maine do. Um, I don't know why they don't. I think winner take all is really dumb. So that, that if I were to change the electoral college, it would be in those two ways. Um, make it more a more proportional, but still give a little bit more weight to the smaller states. Make it so that every state splits their electoral vote. Um, I don't think that it's necessarily inherently bad that smaller states are disproportionately represented in some ways because otherwise they would have absolutely no representation. There's a worse part to this that people often don't talk about. And I know from doing presidential campaigning and helping out presidential campaigners, um, the way the Electoral College works with winner take all, why should anybody ever come to New York or California? Okay. Yep. There's no need. Don't ever come to New York, California. Don't ever. And they don't. So they only go to swing states. So the way you fix that it, it, to, to follow what Destiny's talking about is you have some form of system that's something like this. And again, I'm open to it, but the concept is whoever wins the state gets half electoral votes. Then the other half is divvied up by percentage. What that would do is that would encourage every candidate to go to every state and care about every state because they could win something, right? Why would Trump go to New York? He's not gonna win any of our electoral votes. But what if he could win a chunk of them if say he lost, say he got one third of, of the of the votes in New York State, well, half would go to would have gone to Biden, and then out of the other half, a third of that would have gone to him. He would have got a couple of votes. There's it makes sense for the people in New York State who are Republicans to care about New York State. It makes sense for the Democrats in Oklahoma to actually go out and try to, to vote and get a couple electoral votes for their Democrat in Oklahoma. So I'd like to break it up that way if at all possible. Something like that to where the the person who loses gets less than the amount, but still gets something as an incentive for the local Democrats and Republicans in the red and blue states to still hustle for the presidential candidate to get something out of the, the campaign. Otherwise, why bother? And that's, that's one big issue. When it comes to representation at the congressional level, I would adjust the Senate, but I would not make the Senate the same as the House. I would do something like, as an example, you know, the top 15, the top 15 16 states get three senators, the middle 14 or whatever, whatever the number, number is, get two, and the bottom 16 get one. Something like that, that would be a fairer Senate. But that's we're to, at that point, we're talking amendment to the Constitution. And that kind of thing is probably never gonna happen. So I don't think we can change much of, much of that in the Senate or in Congress. We're probably not gonna get an amendment that way. So I'd rather make it to where the states would, would be a little bit fairer to the losing party or parties so people wanna hustle. Imagine if a libertarian or a green party could actually get an electoral vote, right? Because they get 10% of a state and that would get them one electoral vote. It makes, it makes a change. They get a say. It would be a much better system. All right. Next question is from Mad Men. You guys talked a bit about lifting embargoes and restrictions against other countries, particularly Larry here. Um, so first, starting with uh, Larry, um, what would your response be to human rights abuses and economic exploitation in other countries? For example, how should the U.S. respond to China and the Uyghur Muslims? Absolutely. It's a great question. Um, the sanctions and such actually don't work, right? These things, they, they make us feel good, but they don't change anything. It doesn't matter. The, the fact is, Americans want to spend 25 cents for their crayons at Walmart. And if that happens to be you know, made by Uyghur slave labor, we tend to be okay with that because no one talks about it. I think you have to use the bully pulpit and use actual economic pressure. What does that mean? That means trading with everybody, even those who use slave labor, trade with everybody as much as you possibly can. 
Because what winds up happening is their middle class will begin to grow, number one, which is a great thing, but their oligarchs will still make tons of money. Of course they will, because oligarchs always make tons of money. But then I use the bully pulpit and do what Biden was talking about. This part was good. He was talking about not ignoring it, not staying silent. And I go out of my way to tell people, if you're buying your 25 cent crayons from Walmart, you are saying slave labor is okay. That's what you're doing. And I say that in the bully pulpit every week, every month. That's what's happening right now. And if Americans decide, I don't care, I'm okay with slave labor, then why should the government do anything if the people actually don't care? But I think they do care. And I think what would happen is it'd be a marketing piece that would have to change and shift. And people would stop buying their 25 cent crayons from Walmart. And Walmart will go, guys, stop your policies or we're buying from Vietnam instead, which is a little bit better. And so we'll go to Vietnam, which is not slave labor, but it's kind of close, but we'll go there instead. And I think that is a long-term solution that is not fixed it overnight, but we've been fighting this type of thing for 30 or 40 years and it hasn't worked. Let's try my way for 10 and I bet you'll see a difference. Uh, so Destiny, what do you think about economic sanctions? Do they work and should we be using them? Um, I mean, like as part of like a broader like foreign policy plan initiative, I think that um, sanctions are fairly effective. Um, I mean, you look at places like Iran have been like pretty crushed by economic sanctions. Ideally, this is supposed to bring them um, closer to willing to make like deals or negotiate with the United States. Arguably, that um, the Iranian nuclear deal that we had in place, um, they might have been more incentivized to agree to that because of how strict some of the sanctions were. Um, you know, as part of forging that agreement, was like lifting a lot of the restrictions and embargoes uh, on that. Um, country and uh, unfreezing a lot of their assets. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I think in general, I'm in favor of using sanctions and embargoes as forms of soft power um, to exert influence over other countries. But do you think they work? I mean, you think that's what stopped Iran? You think that's what made them decide? I mean, I, I don't I don't see them working. Cuba hasn't, it, all, all, all it does is, and, and to be forward for so many people who are socialists, all it does is it, allow, it allows us to, to crush socialist countries so that they have no chance of success. That's what we actually use them for. I think we don't the, use them to actually do anything. Well, the, the problem is because America is such, because of how swingy our electoral system has got, it's hard for us to have like a single mind in terms of moving towards some type of solution or anything. Like what a sanction is supposed to do is a sanction is supposed to hurt you um, enough to where you're willing to come to the table to negotiate something. But, I, but it feels like for a lot of countries, we don't know what we want to negotiate. Um, like... It, I guess, yeah, I, I, um, that's just kind of a weakness right now in terms of our, because our, our foreign policy takes like a wildly different shape depending on who the particular president is. So, I, I mean, like you, I mean, look at Trump. Trump literally just walked us out of like, you know, certain treaties. He walked us out of mm -hmm. the Iranian nuclear agreement. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I don't think that's an indictment of sanctions so much as an indictment of America's kind of directionless foreign policy at some points. Um, yeah, that, I let guess me, that would be Let me try something mm -hmm. crazy here. Mm -hmm. What if we instead said to Iran, as an example, Iran, if you want to build a nuclear bomb, good luck. Um, we're going to stop all our sanctions and we want to buy a bunch of your rugs and all kind of stuff. And if you want to trade from us, you can buy anything you want from us. We're going to stop. In fact, all those bases we have in Iraq, we're going to pull them all out. We're going to pull out of Iraq. We're going to pull out of Afghanistan. Iran, good luck, my friend. I hope things go well for you. We're here for you if you need us. Let's trade. What if we did that? And people say, oh, my God, they'll get a nuclear bomb. Oh, my God, they'll do all these cool things. There's zero evidence that that would happen. The best example I can give is Vietnam. We ran out of Vietnam. We lost that war after dropping more bombs on Vietnam in 10 years than we dropped on, on Japan and Germany combined during all of World War II. We devastated that country. We killed 2 million of them at least, if not more. And when we left, 20 years later, they were a trading partner. And now you can buy furniture from Vietnam if you want to. You just leave Iran alone. They'll be our trade, trading partner in 10 years. Well, but, 20 years, probably. I mean, we could be a trading partner, but I think the problem is just that, like, I, like, I, I think there is strong evidence that Iran would pursue a, a nuclear weapons program. Good. They get a nuclear weapon. Okay, you're right. They get a nuclear weapon. So what? Pakistan has nuclear weapons. They are much more volatile and much more anti-American, or as an anti-American as we are. They, mm -hmm. I mean, Osama bin Laden was in Pakistan. Sure, Pakistan but... Has weapons. So well, what? Well, this is true... I think that the problem that we run into then is the types of 
and this is the reason why I, I tend to fight a lot with, I, I notice that a lot of people um, have a very hardcore, and it sounds like you might be on this, a very hardcore anti-imperialist bend when it comes to I American do. foreign influence. Um, and it feels like one of the problems, one of the oversights of that is that if we take that mind, the problem yeah. is if you step out of that area, then it feels like you leave a vacuum that other people are going to seek to fill. And so if, what? So then America loses its ability to negotiate or have a place kind of like as the world so leader. What? So then you let, have let, less let, ability let, to let, forge different deals. You have less access to certain markets. You have 100% to do- 100% not true. Not even close. Come on, man. Let's say we walk out of the Middle East tomorrow. We're not gonna, but sake of argument, we literally just pack our bags and walk out tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And the Russians step in or the Chinese step in or whomever steps in. Mm -hmm. Good, now they'll get killed instead of us and we can sell them bullets to kill each other instead of them selling bullets to their people to kill us. Right now, China sells guns to those people to kill us. Now we can sell guns to them to kill Chinese. Who cares? It's not gonna hurt us in any way. But I think, I think it out. would, because I think we have certain trading partners. Like if you look at the Gulf states, like I don't know yeah. if people like Saudi Arabia or Qatar or the UAE, I don't know if these states are going to look as favorably upon us, if we're gonna be able to sell them um, as many things as we do, or if they'll forge different so types of relationships one. with people you're, with like Russia or China. Me, mm -hmm. That Saudi Arabia, once we move out of uh, stopping in Iran, now that maybe has Iran that might be, you know, I don't could be more aggressive or not, whatever they decide. Mm -hmm. So Saudi Arabia is going to stop buying our weapons. That's what we sell them. We sell them weapons. Mm -hmm. They're going to keep buying our weapons. In fact, now they'll buy more. Potentially, but I, I mean, like they could also forge a stronger relationship with, say, China or Russia. I don't know in terms of Russia now, but at least with China, because I mean, China okay. can manufacture a lot of a weekend, right? So what? Then that means the Iranians will buy our weapons. So what? Uh, well, but so then now we're kind of like tipping the scales to where now all of these different uh, uh, like Gulf states, for instance, are going to be more favorable towards China than they are towards the United States at the moment, right? And you might see that influence creep into other parts of the world as well. Like China's buying a lot of influence across Africa and even South America right now, too. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. So again, why do I care? What, what's, what, so my, my answer instead is to stay in the Middle East and they all hate us. Do some of the oligarchs in the Middle East like us? Yes, because we fill their pockets 100% because we support their regimes. But the average person in the Middle East can't stand our government. They hate our government. They tend to like Americans in general. They tend to, but they hate our government. So if we actually just walked away, they're not going to hate our government anymore. It's impossible. We kill them almost on a daily basis. We are responsible for their misery almost on a weekly or monthly basis. What's the I, I worst mean, that happens? I, I think it super depends on the state we're talking about in terms of if they like us or, or don't like us. Um, like, I'm pretty sure Israel has a pretty favorable view of the United States. Um, I'm pretty sure most of the Gulf states have a pretty favorable view of the United States. Even the people there, I'm pretty sure we have like pretty strong alliances with all these people um, yep. for some reason. You know, like, even Turkey has a pretty, a pretty positive opinion of the United States. It's considered a strong U.S. ally. Um, I, I think that like if, if we end up just exiting that place, um, yep. the vacuum that's created there, I, I guess it depends on if you don't care about U.S. influence in any part of the world or if you don't care about like China's no, growing influence. No, I then... do care about influence. I don't care about American military influence. We still have to, come on. The whole world speaks English. They all watch our movies. They all speak our slang. They all sing our songs. Our culture is everywhere. Our For influence now, is powerful. But that, that, that scale is starting to tip a little bit towards China, yeah? No, not even close. Absolutely. Most of the world does, most of the world does not speak Chinese. Most of the That's world doesn't speak Chinese yet, but like, like so for instance, so 20 years ago, 20, right. 20, 20 years ago, I don't, mm -hmm. and I, and maybe my age is showing, I'm only 32, but Sorry. from what I can remember, 20 years ago, I don't think we really talked much in the United States about like, okay, what is our business plan so that we're successful in Chinese markets? Whereas if you look today in the tech world and then in, even in entertainment, you talk about like the entire world watches US movies, that's true. Well, now yeah. the entire world is watching US movies that are sometimes crafted in ways to appeal to Chinese audiences too, right? Yes. So you can see Absolutely. like that influence growing as well. Um, I, I don't know, I, I kind of like sitting at the top of the world hegemony, I guess, in terms of making decisions um, related to like world policy, um, whether we're talking Security Council in the UN, whether we're talking in terms of like global climate policies, whether we're talking about multilateral trade agreements. Um, I think that being in a stronger negotiating position as somebody that has a lot of influence like the US is probably preferable to taking a back seat to other players that are more willing to get involved in areas like China or Russia. But you're assuming that the reason why we have any of that is because of our military power. And I would argue that China has been growing for exactly the reason I'm talking about. We have been throwing our money, time, energy, and goodwill away on useless forever wars while China has been buying up property, territory, and influence 
throughout the rest of the world. I'm saying let's stop bombing people and invading people and let's stop buying influence like they are. The reason why they're on the rise is because they're not fighting in Afghanistan. They're not fighting in, in, in Syria. They're not fighting in, the, in, in any other place. They're not doing forever. They don't have a massive empire. All their money, time and energy is put into growing financially as ours should be. That's my point. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't. I, I don't disagree, but I mean, like we can do both. I think China does a really good job with their with their foreign influence and in terms of how they reach out. The student exchange programs have got going on with African students, the their One Belt, yep. One Road initiative and trying to build yep. out all the ports and everything. I think China does a really great job there. Um, I guess I just get a little bit worried sometimes when I, I don't, I think that the world would look a bit different if the United States were to just exit you know, immediately, uh, all of our, um, I, I'm not a big fan of a lot of our current military theaters. Afghanistan has a lot of problems and is very directionless. Um, you know, stuff going on in Yemen, I think is, is like is pretty bad. Um, like? What? Is there a war you like? That we uh, well, I don't think the idea of just having like a military base in a country, I don't think is necessarily negative. I think that those types of relationships that we have with other countries and our ability to move, you know, like military vessels around the world, I don't think that that's necessarily a bad thing. But I think there's a big difference between like, oh, like, you know, there's a U.S. naval base in this country versus we have an active ongoing occupational presence in a country, right? Like our military bases in Japan um, are probably pretty important considering, you know, China's aggression in the Southeast Asian, that, that area i was um, at one this photo behind me was mm -hmm. me at one in japan yeah, so I like I, I don't think that Japan would feel very good as uh, as an ally of them if we were to just say like okay, well we're gonna remove everything from here. Um, if China does some stuff, if North Korea keeps testing, you know, they're moving towards their ICBM program. Like good luck. Um, like I think that yeah, there are yeah. people that do appreciate that U.S. presence around the world. I know it's popular to say like, oh everybody hates us everywhere, but I don't no, think no, that's, that's necessarily no, true. No. Mm -hmm. the, the reason why the Japanese want us there is only the same as why the Koreans want us there. It's not because they care about our troops, mm -hmm. because they know that they can't get nuked. This is part of our nuclear umbrella. Sure. Right? That's what it's about. Same thing with because NATO, right? If, yeah. That's correct. If 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 China if we were if, if China nukes Korea or Japan, they will affect Americans and we will and we will counter nuke them. That's the reason why they want our troops there. They don't think that we can actually win a land war against China. They don't think that China's gonna invade Japan and send their troops against Japan and take over Kyushu or, or Hokkaido. Mm -hmm. They don't think that at all. They're worried about nuclear warfare. That's it. That's why our troops are there. So if we can end the idea of, of, of a nuclear warfare and just say, we're pulling out. If you nuke anybody, we will nuke you. We, we get the same same bang for the buck. I guess I just, yeah, I don't know how realistic that is in terms of saying, like, if anybody does anything anywhere, we're going to respond with nuclear arms. Like, it seems like the whole point no, no, no. of being... Only if you nuke. Well, but what about if China just start Like, I don't think it's possible for Russia to roll mm -hmm. tanks into a NATO country because it's Correct. a NATO country. It's not going to happen, yep. right? So yep. I think that there are people, when you look at like even countries like Estonia that have a U.S. Yep. base in there because they've been rolled into NATO, like I think that they yep. probably consider that to be pretty positive. Um, and, and we consider the influence that we have there to be positive as well. I think just pulling out of all of that and saying, well, Russia, if you do anything, we're going to, you know, you can... I didn't say that. It's only the nuke. Oh, so does that mean that they just, they can roll armies in anywhere and just take over people then if they can't? Yeah, let's let's say let's say Russia does that. Let's walk down every road you talk about. I'm happy to walk all the way down that road. Let's say Russia decides we're going to invade Ukraine. Mm -hmm. We're going to roll our tanks across and we're going to take over Ukraine. Mm -hmm. I would ask you an important question, Destiny. Are you prepared to send your friends, your loved ones, the people that you care about, to go die for Ukraine? Yeah, I think it's. I think we have to. Yeah. I'm not. I think it's a terrible idea. I think it is a horrible idea. It didn't work in Vietnam, didn't work in Yemen, didn't work in Afghanistan. It worked in World work War II, anything. right? We we weren't going there. We, that, that's not why we went there. We weren't we weren't going there. We went there because they attacked us. Well, Japan attacked us, and then we went to Europe, right? I mean, we eventually Germany, we got to Germany. Germany declared war on us. Sure. We never declared war on Germany. We weren't going to go fight Germany. But we did, right? We did. We, it wasn't because Japan. Germany declared war on us. Sure, but I, in but, both cases. We were attacked or war was declared upon us. Different issue. Ukraine's not declaring war on us. Russia's not declaring war on us. Mm -hmm. Russia's not attacking us. How do you feel about we like- We're now getting involved in someone else's war? I'll pass, it has never worked. When we're attacked, we retaliate. Of course we do. Japan attacked us and Germany declared war on us. No, we didn't declare war on Finland. Finland was a German ally. We didn't declare war on Finland. 
because Finland was never going to attack us. Kept no, we were never going to face a Finnish assault ever. So we might have, we might have felt with Romanians or Bulgarians that we fought in Europe, maybe, but we were never going to deal with Finns. We never declared war on Finland. So in the case of in the case of World War II, um, or we could go even further into the future. We can look at the first Gulf War. Whatever we can look at intervention in Bosnia or Yugoslavia. For for anything for for World War II, let's say that um, Germany's empire continues to grow. As long as we never get attacked, then we should just chill and keep trading with everybody. Is that the goal? We don't have any investment in who ends up being at the the table of like the world leaders. No, like, I, I think what we do is what we did in places like Vietnam and such. If that were to happen, right? I'll, I'm gonna. You want to go down World War II? I'll go down that road. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to go down that road. Let me. Let me let me do the Ukrainian road, then I go down Germany's road. Okay. Ukraine today, the Russians decide they're going to invade Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Good luck holding Ukraine. Please tell me one modern nation in the past, I don't know, 50 years, 100 years, who's been able to conquer land and hold it. Well, the I mean, land isn't is a Ukraine pain to hold. Well, you, more people, more problems. Ukraine. Uh, okay, I'm, I, uh, unless I'm That's having a huge one. failure in geography, it was in Ukraine literally like a satellite of the Soviet Union. It was. It, yeah, so yes. they held them, they held Ukraine. Yeah, actually, that's true, because it's called the Ukraine, which I think means, like, the front lands or something. That was why it was, I think, given even that yes. name or something. So, um, that's correct. Yeah, yeah, so, I mean, like, the Soviet Union held a lot of these territories for quite a long time. For 60 years? That's so a about decent like amount of time, years? yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think that's so, a good amount of time, yeah. In, 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 the, in, the, in the history of the world, not much, and they were rebellious there, too. If the Germans, in World War II, many people don't know this, if the Germans didn't have their horrible Nazi... Um, ways mm -hmm. when they went to Ukraine, Ukraine was prepared to change sides and join the Germans against the Russians. But the Germans didn't care. They were so busy at killing Jews and killing Ukrainians. They, they their, their harbor policies, because they were Nazis, obviously, the Ukrainians would have actually joined and fought against the Russians. So first off, could they do it? Probably not. But not just that. Let's say they do. Let's they actually invade Ukraine. And now they're in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. You tell me the European Union is going to be OK with that. They're going to go, yeah. I guess we lost Ukraine. Well, Next. are you telling? Do you That's think that? The, happen? But the European Union isn't prepared to mobilize like the United States is, right? Do you think the European Union is going to try to intervene? And also, hold on. Why should the European Union be motivated to do anything? Because wouldn't wouldn't uh, wouldn't a Larry Sharp in France say the same thing? Like, okay, well, my fellow Frenchmen, do you guys want to go die for? You want your friends and family to go die for a war that's happening over in Ukraine? Like, wouldn't that be the exact same? If there was a Larry Sharp in France, probably yes. But if there was a, but if there was a Larry Sharp in say Poland, mm -hmm. no, because now you're on my border. Well, yeah, but that's now, but this is the, now I'm worried. This is kind of the now problem though, border. right? Where it's like yeah. if we're only looking at our immediate future, then anybody yeah. that's looking like a little bit more long term is always going to be like one step ahead of you, uh, because any anything that like an empire like what the German Empire was or the Soviet Union or whatever that's just encroaching on one country at a time um, is always going to have success against that one smaller power, right? In a way, this is almost kind of like what happened with the peace movement with Germany in World War II. It just it seems yeah. like that kind of plan is always going to lead to like some empire growing and then eventually being able to like. Put Put us in a really bad position that wouldn't but have happened otherwise. I asked otherwise. you a specific question. And yeah. the question was, are you prepared to send your people over? And I said no. Mm -hmm. I asked that question because our Constitution has a decent thing in it that I like tremendously, which is only the Congress can declare war. Mm -hmm. So if the American people say, yes, this is a bridge too far, we are prepared to send, send our sons and daughters to die in Ukraine, then the Congress declares war. And then we send our sons and daughters to die in Ukraine. But it's not because some president goes American interest, which is what we do. This is a trivia question for your for your listeners. Uh -oh. When's the last time the United States declared war? Oh man, hold on. If I what was it like? The, was it even the first? Was it? Uh, did we even actually declare war against Saddam Hussein? We asked for an authorization of military force. I don't think. I don't know if that was a declaration of war. Nineteen forty-two against was it World Bulgaria, war II? Yeah. Romania. And the other German satellite states, mm -hmm. Hungary, German, Bulgaria, and Romania. Yet we've been in perpetual war for 80 years. Sure. This is what has to stop. If you believe and the people can say, yes, I believe this is it. I'm prepared to send my son and daughters off to die in Ukraine. I'm in. We voted for it. The country's in. Let's go do it. I'm against us deciding American interests and now Marines have to die. That's not the answer. But if you're telling me the American people say, yes, I'm prepared. If you vote yes and say, tell your country, yeah, my, my son, when he's old enough, I want him to go fight in Ukraine and die. Okay, go. Sure. Well, I'm so in. like, I, I mean, I don't, 
I don't necessarily disagree. That's so, well, and it, well, sure, but this is kind of a different question, right? So, technically, I, I support the democracy, and we shouldn't go to war if we don't want to, even if I agree. So, the question was initially whether or not I would agree with a particular war. Um, I, not should I should we send people to die over like the will of the American people? Obviously, I think that the will of the American people is important, and we should get that um, before we formally declare war on anybody. Now, we didn't formally declare war, but I'm pretty sure that we did have popular support for military. Um, for, for military operations, because we did do a vote, That's I believe, in Congress. That's not a where... thing. That's some shit we made up. That's not in the Constitution. That's some shit we made up. We sure, I mean, we can we can call it what we want, but if we would, I mean, like... No, if no, you, no, we shouldn't. We, I, we should I understand what you're saying. War. I'm just saying that, like, if you lived in the U.S., it sounds like you're from New York, after 9-11, we would have voted to go to war with Iraq. Well, we would have voted to go to war with any country in the world, probably. Bush could have literally thrown a dart on a map, and we would have voted in support of going to war. For so I understand that maybe we didn't do it with, like, a formal declaration of war, but it, there was congressional action that had the use of military force authorized there, and the American public would have supported it 100%. Um, I understand... Then why didn't we declare war on Afghanistan? Why didn't we? Yes. Um, I'm not because 100% they sure. weren't. They didn't want war against Afghanistan because they wanted military action that the president could control. Mm -hmm. And that's my point. That should never exist. That should never exist. Well, I'm sorry, there's one exception, responding to a nuclear attack. With that exception, the exception of responding to a nuclear, nuclear attack, that should never exist. The president should never be able to say, we're going to just put troops in the country because of American interest. No, declare war or good luck, guys. Well, I think, but there's a second piece I want to deal with here. Well, yeah, well, the, real quick on the first one. How do you deal that, with removing what you consider to be like terrorist aspects? So when we get, went to Afghanistan, our goal wasn't yeah. to destroy the Afghanistan government. We didn't want to declare war on Afghanistan. The, technically, yeah. the, the military action was supposed to be against the Taliban. So yeah. how, what is, what, in, I guess, in your world, or how, what would be your ideal way? Like, do you... Hundred you... percent. We we need basically three parts to our military plus a plus a side part. Three parts of military plus a side part. Number one, we have to keep our nuclear deterrent. So nuclear weapons have to exist in America. We have to keep nuclear deterrent. That's critical. Mm -hmm. We should keep them upgraded. Spend the money. I'm totally fine with that. No worries. Second, we need to have massive cyber ability, which we do not. We are far behind other nations. We need to have cyber attack. Cyber is the new mad mutually assured destruction that nuclear was back in the day. We're in Cold War II. Cold War I was against Soviet Union as a senior partner, China as a junior partner. We fought our proxy wars against China. Now in Cold War II, because we, we won the Cold War I, but we lost the peace. And when we lost the peace, now China is our number one in Cold War II, with Russia is now the, the second. We fight our proxy wars against Russia now instead of against China in Syria and stuff like that. Different issue, Afghanistan. We fight, we fight the proxy wars there instead. So we've changed that. Back then, in, in the day of the Cold War, we were ahead of the game the whole way through. Against China, we're behind. In, 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 uh, in the first Cold War, espionage was the key way we fought, and mutual assured destruction was um, nuclear. China, it's the markets that are our fight, mm -hmm. and cyber is the actual um, mutual assured destruction. So we need to have massive cyber ability to literally devastate a country and put into the dark ages with a cyber attack. We don't have that. We do that. Russia can't touch our elections. Russia can't do anything to us at all. We'll just cyber attack them into the Stone Age. That's what we should be able to do. We can't now. Third, special forces. The United States has the best special forces in the world, and we should at least triple the amount that we have and dismantle most of the rest of our military. Most of it, not all, but a, a huge amount. We don't need all our tanks and all our fighter jets. All that. We need special forces. If we had a bunch of special forces, there's a another Osama bin Laden. We send our special forces after him. Within two years, almost any place in the, in the world, he's dead. There's almost no one who could who get to more places than our special forces could. And the last piece is a Navy large enough to ensure that we have fair and safe trading lanes. That's what our military should look like. That's it. All these other things, we don't need them at all. Someone messes with us, if it's an individual player, which most will be, special forces take care of it. If it's a state player, the threat is... You want to affect our elections? We'll cyber attack you. We'll give you six Chernobyls. That's the way you deal with today's world, what it should be. You ask what it should be. We're not there. That's my perfect world with our military. That's how we deal with it. You want to cross over to Germany? Cyber attack. You literally can't get your troops across the board anymore because you're not going to have power plants. That's the kind of thing I want. Okay. No more invasions. Invasions are silly. Invasions don't work. That's why we don't invade anymore. There's no more tank battles. Intellectual property is far more important than physical property. F not even close. Far more important. What are, what's going to happen? What, are Chinese going to invade uh, California? What are they going to get? Nice views, I guess. 
Well, the Lindsville property will be gone. It'll be in Oklahoma by the time. Jet well, yeah, I'm not. Yet. We're not worried about like mainland invasions. It's just more that like if countries, if smaller countries in Eastern Europe started to get rolled over by Russia, um, I the, the the Brits have nuclear weapons. The French have nuclear weapons. Yeah, but Great Britain and France are that's really far to the west. There's a lot of countries you can roll over before They're you get way to. Them. Further than they are. Yeah, I know, but that but the point of like NATO is that like if you invade one of us, you invade all of us. So now you have the full force of the United States brought to your doorstep if you decide to start invading countries. The reason one of the major reasons why Russia is fighting us and doesn't trust us is because we expanded NATO. Mm -hmm. That's how we lost the Cold War. I uh, lost the peace. I'm sorry, we won the war, lost the peace. The peace should have been the Soviet Union collapses. Great. NATO's disbanded or at least America leaves it. We don't need what, what, we, need, what we need it for. Walk away. Walk away. That would have told the Russians and the people who all got, took over Russia were from the Soviet Union that we're not their enemy anymore. But we didn't do that. Instead, we encroached all the way to their border, trying to get every single person to NATO as if Russia was still a threat and Russia acted accordingly. So you think the only policy. reason why Russia like rolled tanks in Georgia? Not what I said. Or, okay, the sorry. biggest reason. The biggest, the biggest reason, reason why, why Russia they don't trust us is because we lost the we lost the peace after the Cold War. Hmm. Okay. Um, I, we, I I feel like other countries, especially the ones that have opted to join NATO, would would much prefer some sort of like warm relationship with a stronger um, foreign power rather than just kind of being left at the mercy of if Russia decides to become active again. But I guess in your in your mind, your idea is that if we would have just disbanded NATO, everybody would have been more friendly and things would have chilled. I think Russia wouldn't have been as aggressive. That's what I think. They would not have been as aggressive. And here's my example. We were punitive against Germany in World War I. That got us World War II. Mm -hmm. We were kind to Germany and Japan after World War II. Not a problem, best buddies. Generally speaking, the nicer you are after a war, the better off it is. One of the reasons why World War II lasted so long is because, is because of the incompetent Roosevelt saying unconditional surrender. That was the reason. There was no need to nuke, nuke Japan. There was no need to even do D-Day. Wasn't required. None of it. The Germans were already talking surrender. So were the Japanese. But Roosevelt said unconditional. And because they were harsh and terrible regimes, they projected themselves onto them and thought unconditional means we're all going into camps. Because we would put you in camps. So they assumed they were all going into camps. So they said, you know what? Fight to the death because we're not going into camps. That's what wound up happening. They tried to kill Hitler 44 times, 44 times. Imagine if we had said instead, instead, Germany, we got you. You're losing in Russia. You're losing in America. We're, we're getting ready to aid France. We've, we're already in Italy. The war is over. Guys, give us Hitler and maybe whatever, two dozen other massive Nazis, hand them over to us. We'll talk peace. We'll talk peace. Give us the Nazis overthrow him and we, we want these guys, we want their heads on a pike, give us their heads on a pike, we'll talk peace. Imagine what would happen. The last year of the war, all those Jews in the camps not killed. All the Americans who died, all the I mean, Russians it's, I, who yeah, died. I mean, it, it would be nice if we could run like a historical counterfactual, but I mean, like we can't. Like I like I think, I'm pretty sure Japan was literally ready to fight to the last man standing. They were not. Um, we, I mean, they we say talking, that, but. They were talking to Russia already in 45 about peace because we wouldn't talk to them. They were already devastated. They were uh, already devastated. Yeah, I mean, I, I wish we could see how it would have went otherwise. I mean, um, I- well, even yeah, if I, I'm wrong, even if I'm wrong, I'll go back to my same thing I talked, even if I'm wrong, would it have hurt to talk to them? If we were wrong, we would, the same thing would have happened. There's no lose in what I'm saying. I mean, if I'm, we simply said, we'll talk to you about it. And they would have said, go to hell. Fight us. I'm, okay, I'm, pre I'm pretty sure that. the Japanese were like, I, I'm not a World War II historian expert, but I know that it's been, because I know there was like, there's kind of like the story that Japan had already tried to surrender after the first bomb and, the, and we decided to refuse the surrender. Uh, I, I, every time I've looked into that, it seems to, the, the, the historical consensus I seem to find is that like any, there, there, any tepid talks about peace or whatever didn't really have any teeth behind them. And Japan was like willing to go the, the distance when it came to fighting the, the U.S. Um, because they didn't consider like a ground invasion to be possible by the U.S. and that they were ready to, to, to bear out that war for, as long as possible but, but i mean like again like it's, it's hard to argue like what would have happened otherwise like the only no, thing that i can look to historically my, my, is that like we, we tried like appeasement for for germany and it didn't work I, the idea that we could just say like oh give us your commanders and you know like we'll stop fighting or give us your commanders and the war will end or whatever i don't know if they would do that without they're also like losing tons of ground because an actual ground war is being fought yeah no maybe you're right i, I you're mm -hmm. right my point is my tactics just like what i'm always saying 
if I'm wrong, the same thing still happens. It doesn't get worse if I'm wrong, right? If we talk to the Germans and said, hey, give us your Nazis, whatever number we want, and we'll start talking peace. If they go to hell with you, invade, then we still would have invaded anyway. Like it would have changed. But maybe they would have been like, really? I, I would like you to stop, stop bombing us. I, I, our economy is shot. You've been bombing us so our cities are, are rubble. Yes, we'd like you to stop bombing us, please. We'll give you the Nazis. They might have. If they didn't, we still keep going. But if they did, we at least show a humanism. And again, I'll say it again. We show a humanism that would have allowed the people a chance for all those people who died. For, have you ever seen well, the surrender, movie? Well, surrender, is, just, surrender yeah. is always on the table, right? It's not like they weren't able no, to surrender. No, it isn't. Of course not it World is. Two, it was not. Well, it was it, not. But, the reason, but why wasn't it? Because Roosevelt said unconditional surrender. What did that mean, That's though? That's the reason. That means there's no conditions. You don't discuss it. Well, it, it, but more importantly, yeah. but more importantly, it meant forfeiture of like the territories that they conquered, right? Like we, we're not going to let Japan or Germany just like, okay, okay, we surrender, <clears throat> but everything that we captured is still ours, right? Well, like when you talk about like unconditional surrender, of like you're talking not. about like forfeiture of like you, of all the territories you capture, like you can't just unconditional surrender means we will do what we want with your leadership, your land, and your population. We will do whatever we want. We'll take all of your land. We will not allow Germany to exist anymore. That kind of stuff happened. We will not allow your nation to exist anymore. We will take a chunk of it, give it to the Netherlands, a chunk of it, give it to Poland, a chunk of it, give it to France and Austria. You no longer exist as a nation. That's what they were thinking because that's what Germans did. The Nazis were horrible and brutal and erased cultures. So they assumed we would do it to them and they would rather die then. The Japanese did the same thing. The Japanese forced the Koreans to speak Japanese. They were erasing Korea. So they assumed we'd erase them. So we could just say, let's talk. You can still exist as a nation. You're gonna have to give everything back. You're gonna pay a price, but you can exist as Germany. You will still exist, which is what we're gonna do anyway. But they didn't know that. They didn't believe that because they weren't that way. They were horrible. If you see the atrocities that Japanese and Germans did, I know we always talk about the Germans, Japanese were really bad too. Like mm -hmm. they were really, they were right up there. They were really bad. Yeah, the Unit Seven Thirty One stuff and the rape of Nanking and all that. Absolutely. Whatever. Yeah. So why in the world would they have given that with unconditional? That was so Roosevelt was so dumb thinking that he should be like, no, we're not going to rape all your women and cart off your men to camps, which is what they did. I, do, I don't think I don't think that was what they thought was on the table, but I guess it's hard to know. I don't think that they thought that like if we unconditionally surrendered to America, they're going to send like the rape squads over to our country like we've done to some people, but. I mean, they did. Okay. I mean, they did. Like, they did send the rape squads. Like, they did that. So why wouldn't they think that we would? But my point, again, is the same. Again, if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. why not take the high road? Why not have the conversation? It doesn't hurt. If I'm wrong, we still bomb them and invade them anyway. And if I'm right, we have a chance at saving lives. Why wouldn't I do that? I'm not a big fan of killing people for nothing. Just okay. not. Not a big fan. Whether they're Germans or Nazis or Americans or whatever, I don't want to kill them for nothing. Not my thing. I'm sorry, I went way long on this, but this was, this was a question, wasn't it? I didn't just talk for nothing. Uh, yeah, we were <laughs> talking about stuff, yeah. Yes. So, so. We, we got to three hours. Uh, I got to do my due diligence and just plug our, our server here. Um, this was hosted by Blue Politics, discord.gg slash blue politics uh it's the largest server on discord that is dedicated towards civil discussion of politics we've been here with destiny and larry sharp i think it'd be fantastic if we one day got you two together just to debate foreign policy um that was a great half hour teaser there uh <laughs> but once again thanks guys for coming on um uh it's always great to set these kinds of discussions up this was great and as a moderator i was completely irrelevant which is my favorite time thank you guys <laughs> Yeah, thanks thank for the you, conversation. I super appreciate Destiny, it. Destiny, thank fun. you, my friend. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Are you um? Do you have? Are you like um? Are you running again for anything? Do you want to plug like a page or anything? Or? Um, guys, if anybody's interested, please head over to Sharpway. All I'm on all the interwebs. Or Google Larry Sharp. I'm I'm on all of up for page one. Enjoy. I hope you guys care about what I'm doing and my ideas. And I, if you have anything, any ideas, please reach out to me. My team will monitors all my social media. It'll get back to me. Okay, cool. Um, Thanks, guys. Yeah, we'll see you guys later. Honestly, I don't know how I feel about the no-fly zone. Most of the stuff the guy brought up was like pretty moderate. I don't think I...
super disagree. The only problem is when you start getting into like the private financing of stuff. The problem is that it, it rests on so many hypotheticals and things you could go fuck. like certain ways that you never really know. Like, so it's hard to, it's hard to argue against it. Also, this is something that I noticed. I started to keep track of this more. Um, I have a really hard time giving really hard pushback against people that seem like really friendly. Three moto, four dollars and ninety nine cents. The whole thing about Germany wanting peace in 1944 seems to be BS. I couldn't find anything but people in forums talking about what if. Nice, because um, he seems like really friendly. So I want to. I don't want to be like, uh, like, no, this is totally wrong. This will never work. Because <laughs> it sounds really mean. But like, I see there could be like so many problems with like the private roads being built over in private shit but like but maybe not but maybe yeah but maybe not like it's hard you know like it's hard to know like it's I, it's hard to argue against like those kinds of hypotheticals because it's so divorced from like what's actually like existing right now you know remember to hit that like and subscribe and don't forget the notification bell so that my videos show up right in your feed test 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 i'm honest